Welcome everybody. It's uh, seven o'clock Eastern time. And uh, we wanna welcome everybody to the American Foregut Society webinar. We're so excited that everybody could join here today. We have an extremely esteemed panel um, of discussants and presenters this evening. And um, I wanna thank my, uh, um, my co-chair, uh, Barham, uh, he has worked tirelessly, both of us, um, you know, Barham came up with the idea and has worked tirelessly to put together this uh, agenda for us tonight. And tonight we're going to talk about the endoscopic management of complications after bariatric surgery. You're going to hear from experts around the world, um, both from GI and from surgery. And our hope is that we can come up uh, with uh, an algorithmic approach to leak management um, after sleeve gastrectomy. Is there a lot of ways to skin this cat? And you're gonna hear a lot about all of them here this evening. And um, uh, our goal was to bring some of the world experts together to see if we could come to some sort of a consensus and uh, use this as a launch pad for further management and future management of these patients. So, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to um, uh, Vivek and Reem, who are going to uh, moderate our next section. Great, thank you so much. And thank you, um, Barham and Lena, for the invitation. And as you said, it's a very exciting program. So we're gonna start and I'll introduce um, Barham Abudeye, who is, um, uh, doesn't need really any introduction. Uh, he's a professor of uh, medicine at the Mayo Clinic uh, Hospital and director of innovation, director of the endobariatric uh, program, and also um, director of a lot of things, including um, the uh, AFS uh, bariatric chapter, who he co-leads with Lena um, as well. So uh, without further ado, Barham, can you uh, present your first case? Absolutely. Thank you, Reem. And thank you, Vivek, for leading this uh, blog of the uh, or part of the webinar. And this is uh, this part is case based uh, discussion. Uh, so we're hopefully uh, we will stop multiple times and ask our, our expert faculties uh, their opinion about management of some of the complex uh, situation that we're going to encounter. So the first case is of a 68 year old female. She is 11 months post sleeve leak. The leak did not happen at our institution. We get the patient 11 months later. In the interval uh, of the 11 months preceding uh, her presentation, she was treated with a percutaneous drain to the leak site. She had multiple luminal uh, self-expanding metal stents. Uh, she had an attempted endoscopic suture closure of the leak site. And in that interval, since her leak, she was managed with a combination of nasojejunal tube feedings and, uh, and TPN through that, throughout the duration of uh, her presentation. So when we got her, she, it was already a chronic situation. Uh, she was still on TPN and we, the stents were removed and you, uh, on endoscopy, that's what we visualize, you enter, uh, you could see there's a dehiscence from the uh, previous trial of uh, suture closure of that leak site. You could see that the percutaneous drain is uh, very uh, obvious at the site of the leak, and it's a quite uh, wide defect uh, with a collapsed cavity that is broad based at this point. Uh, to uh, so it's not very ideal for accommodating uh, any internal drainage stents because they're going to migrate uh, outside. So with that, I will stop and hand it to uh, Viv Vivek and Dream to start uh, asking us any questions. Um, so very nice presentation and video of a very complex uh, case. Um, Dr. Wilson, what's going through your mind when you see uh, a case like this? Or, or Dr. Galvao or Thompson or Dr. Kaysan, I just thought I'd start with one and point. <laughs> All right, uh, thanks Reem. Yeah, I'll chime in. Um, when you have uh, you know these chronic uh, leaks, then you're 
and, and, and I'll actually talk about this later, but what you're basically trying to do is figure out uh, what is causing the leak to, to be maintained. What's, what's causing um, the cavity to still be there. And that cavity um, uh, is potentially an abscess cavity that can repressurize it. it. It, at this point, it probably becomes a food cavity that intermittently can expand and contract. So the principle you're trying to think about is what's causing that, that, that place to repressurize that abscess cavity repressurize and how do you manage depressurizing it? And so this is about a whole bunch of, of drainage techniques to try to figure out how to get the pressure off. And so you've got to think about how do you get the pressure down inside the cavity and how do you get whatever they drink or eat um, or even their own saliva to not go into the cavity preferentially and getting it to go down the sleeve itself. And so what is going on as it relates to the sleeve structure itself that's uh, providing back pressure? Um, is the incisure tight? Is there an issue with the pylorus? Uh, is there something anatomic with the sleeve shape itself that needs to be addressed with dilatation? Um, and then how well is the cavity drained and can it be drained better? So those are the basic principles that uh, I think you have to focus on. So perfect. You've touched upon a lot of um, good, good teaching points, which hopefully we'll, we'll hear about. Um, Dr. Thompson, you heard about the, uh, the different uh, treatments that this patient already had. Um, is there anything else you would have done differently initially, or you, you sort of, that's how the management, I mean, we're going to talk about the algorithm, hopefully in, in the, in the second and third session, but what do you think of what's been done so far? Sure. Uh, you know, hindsight's 2020, of course, but, um, I tend to like to do internal drainage earlier if I can, I find that, you know, if it's not, if you don't catch it really quickly. Uh, stents and trying to suture them closed uh, tend not to be as effective. So I like getting the pigtails in as early as I can to do internal drainage and trying to, you know, get rid of the external drain um, to, to, you know, really stop the flow just going through the area. And um, I, I find that that tends to be more effective. I also like to get out and clean the area, make sure there's no foreign material in there early on. Sometimes you'll, you know, I found all sorts of stuff out there, chewing gum and other things that just serves a nidus for infection and, and prevent the thing from healing. So, and of course I agree with Eric with, you know, really, you know, being very thorough about making sure there's no, uh, you know, increased pressure due to pyloric stenosis or, you know, twisting of the sleeve or something and addressing that as well. So up to that point, that's kind of, uh, you know, what I would have been thinking about. Okay, great. Rim. Rim. Yes. Rim, I think, uh, good evening, everyone. So thank you for the invitation. You see one of the mistakes that we've done with the leaks of the sleeve, if you ask me, especially it's a fault of we surgeons, is we've been dealing with leaks and fistulas, chronic fistulas forever, but we never converted to that endoscopic fistula after the sleeve. So I totally agree with Eric in this concept that once you see this, we know that fistulas remain chronic for four reasons. Obstruction, so you need to see if there's high pressure strictures. Second is infection, as Chris Thompson just mentioned. The third one is foreign body. So Chris mentioned that he will remove foreign body. Uh, and third one is malnutrition. So I think we need to evaluate since the beginning with any chronic fistula after the leak, after the sleeve, those four points. One, we understand that origin we can decide what will be better for the patient. That, that, that will, I think we need to start there, looking for the origin. That's great. And with that in mind, uh, Barham, what did you do next? Yes, so next is, it's been 11 months. They tried everything there, and uh, now there is a big uh, 16 French percutaneous drain that is actually poking into that area. So the idea was, as, as our colleagues suggested, is we, I wanted to try to kind of enhance drainage internally and, and try to block this percutaneous track uh, opening uh, in order to allow things to drain internally and slowly collapse. So at that point, I did not think the cavity is, uh, is, uh, is appropriate for double pigtail because even I tried to put a double pigtail, it immediately migrates out because it's a big mouth area uh, there that it will not hold the pigtail. 
So I thought I would capitalize on the percutaneous drain and try to deliver this Gore A uh, matrix plug. I'm not sure if a bunch of you are familiar with the, with these. These are they're used to for abdominal hernia repair. They're bioabsorbable uh, after a few months, but they're quite robust plugs actually, and you could pull them over a snare. So what we've done with this case is the following: is I introduced a snare through percutaneous track, took it out of the mouth, and used a snare to pull the plug. Uh, into that leak cavity and jam the octopus legs into the percutaneous tract to allow it to isolate that pressure out of the percutaneous tract and allow for internal uh, drainage. So here we're pulling this plug using the snare uh, and under fluoroscopic guidance and we're wedging it in the percutaneous tract so the disc of the plug is occluding that tract. And now the cavity becomes a, a bit isolated after we did some cleaning uh, in there. And you can see we're really wedged it. So we're pulling hard from the skin side in order to wedge it there so it won't migrate out. Uh, and that become, uh, uh, becomes good. And the, the good thing with these is they're bioabsorbable. So in a few months, they will be gone and incorporated into fibrotic uh, scar uh, as shown here. And I wanted to enhance even pressure further. So what we've done is we use these MCL uh, 18 French drains and put it transnasal uh, into that cavity because they're bigger drains and connected it to a low intermittent suction. So now it's almost like a vacuum therapy that the, the percutaneous pressure is isolated. And now we're applying significant low intermittent suction to that area to allow this cavity, this cavity to start collapsing. So I will stop here and hand it back to you, Reem. Hey, um, uh, Galvao, what do you think of uh, what's been done? Would you have done anything differently? Um, what do you think of this approach? I mean, it's it's sort of the end all game, right? We've tried stenting, we've tried suturing, internal drainage. Uh, what do you think? I think it's a very creative uh, way to do that. So, Braham include the hole and he drained externally on that. That's that's very, uh, very, very creative. And I think it will be effective. But uh, on our side, uh, we, are, we, are, we will be betting on low tech. So that's that's the case. We usually do septotomies and uh, aggressive pneumatic dilation. And uh, it seems to work as well. Uh, but uh, I like the, this idea. If I have the resources, I'll, I'll I'll try to be fancy like that, but uh, in our in our uh, in our service in the, the the service that we share with uh, here in Brazil, that's that's the case. We will we'll go for septotomy and pneumatic dilations. Dr. Keitan, um, what do you think of of um, of all of this? It's four weeks of intermittent suction as a surgeon. Would you be okay with the GIs trying this for four weeks, or would you be itching? to go back to the OR at this point, it's been nearly a year. Um, how long would you give it until you sort of re-operate? You know, I'm gonna try as hard as possible to not operate. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> operating on these patients, you're just uh, going into a, a landmine. And, um, and uh, you know, a lot of, most of the time, as long as you've gotten rid and I think um, Eric made all those great points about, you know, the pressure. And if you are able to get rid of that distal pressure that is keeping that from closing, eventually it's going to heal. And if it doesn't heal, then you got to do something about the pressure. And that's, that's really um, kind of the, the crux, of, crux of the situation. And, you know, and that's where you, it's really important to evaluate the sleeve morphology. But, you know, uh, so i a, I try to avoid surgery, but, and B, you know, talking the patient through this uh, and looking for a more definitive treatment. I mean, you have to think about why has this not healed for so long? You know, what, what else is, is going on with this patient? So, you know, for something that's been around for a year, you know, and there's still a substantial cavity externally, I'm, I'm still concerned a little bit, is there something distal going on? 
So I, I have a question and maybe Barham or anyone from the panel can answer that. I mean, we're thinking of um, the four points that Natan had, had brought up. Um, obviously, nutrition is, is key here. So I was going to ask Barham how the patient was being fed. But um, my question is, is when you have an IR drain and an internal drainage, do you think that they sometimes act against each other and that perpetuates the... Um, the, the, the leak to stay open? And should we aim early on to remove the IR drain after we have source control of infection? I mean, at some point that drain is gonna stent things open, you know? So at some point you need to start backing it out. Um, maybe you, because it's chronic, you don't just pull it out all the way. I tend to kind of incorporate these drains like pull them out part way and just try to create a controlled fistula and then pull them out a little bit more so that they're kind of withdrawn depending on how deep they are over the course of a few days or a week. Okay, great. So Barham, why don't you tell us what happened next? Yeah. So post MCL drain removal after four weeks of intermittent suction, we got a CT, upper GI, there's no residual collection or leak. Uh, the, uh, we did CT with oral contrast, and this is here the upper GI through the sleeve morphology and showing no leak. However, uh, the patient at that point continued to uh, describe principal symptoms of pain and cough. Uh, so I will stop here and see what the panel think. This is the leak cavity. Remember, it was a big cavity. Now all the suction uh, for four weeks have collapsed it. Uh, the, you don't see the plug anymore. It's probably incorporated in the percutaneous track and there's no leak or cavity, residual cavity seen or, uh, or significant residual cavity seen on CT or on upper GI series. Uh, would you claim victory here and just walk away, say, thank you so much, I'm done. What do we, what do, we do? Look for the lung. Yeah, look in the lung. If they're coughing, you're worried about a fistula now to the across the diaphragm into the bronchus, possibly just the pleura if you're lucky, but it also could go into the bronchus. Okay, how do we look into the lung? I mean, do you see a collapsed cavity and CT does not, and the upper GI series does not give you any indication. So what, what's your modality here? So the CT is completely normal, Barham. There's no atelectasis in the lung. There is no atelectasis. Or, or anything like that, you don't see any consolidation in the base of the left lung, then you probably don't have a lung issue. But with the cough, I would be surprised if there wasn't some consolidation in the left lower lung by CT. And, 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 yeah, and by the way, you have looked to the lung. Yes. I mean, the lung does have consolidation and atelectasis for sure. That's why we got concerned mm -hmm. and with the cough, we, we wanted to explore that further and we did, but it was not obvious until you put an ERCP occlusion balloon and probe that track. So we used an angled hydrophilic wire with an ERCP occlusion balloon uh, with, with the cap. And you could see that there's a sinus track that we dug into, which led to a kind of a small uh, serpent-like uh, cavity. And with careful maneuvering of the wire, you went from that, that sinus track uh, into the diaphragm and the wire actually came out of the ET tube uh, through the bronchus. So now you have a wire coming out from the stomach, leak cavity, diaphragm, back, back into the bronchus and out of the ET tube. You see, uh, the, <laughs> it's interesting uh, to, be, to be old. And I have seen that also. So what happens that, uh, Abraham, that cavity, and I could count at least two or three orifices uh, aside to the, the main one. So these cavities tend to be, the, those very chronic ones, tend to be very complex. So uh, what possibly can have happened is that you occlude the main output. So increase the pressure for some way in that secondary ducts that were like uh, dorming, and they become active and it's just... Uh, uh, just a guess. So Dr. Thompson, um, what would you do with, with this? I know you have some experience with the ASD occluders. Would this be something you would do there? Uh, would you do something else? 
What would be yeah, your thought process? That, that's a tough one. You know, in the past, before we had the occluders, we would consider uh, to seal glue in the cavity and, you know, repeated injections had worked in some patients, but um, we have used these occluders successfully whenever, you know, we start having fistula to the lung. Um, it's, a, it's a good place to use them. Uh, prefer to use them when there's only one track. You know, if you have multiple branches and things are going all over the place, they're less effective. But if you could get this, you know, if you could, if you can really kind of get this thing positioned in the right way, I think it would be effective in this kind of case. Barham, what did you do next? Yeah, so I struggled with that. Uh, at that point, of course, I'm gonna I I I, I involved my colleagues from thoracic surgery and thoracic surgery to kind of try to reach what to do next as a team rather than me making this decision in this young complex case. And the consensus was is as Dr. Thompson alluded is try the septal occluder because what we'll be looking at otherwise is an esophageal jejunostomy with lobectomy and the quite complex involved uh, surgery. And if it fails, they were prepared to remove all the hardware during the time of surgery uh, anyhow. So that's where we embarked. And that's where I struggled a little bit because to me, the septal occluders are designed to occlude exposed muscle. And just me putting the septal occluder in the cavity, I had concerns that I'm just gonna make the situation worse without terminating the communication between the lung and the abdominal cavity. That was the goal with the septal occluder is to separate the lung, which is negative pressure from the abdominal cavity so we could have more effective internal drainage uh, with the patient. So that's what we embarked on is I used the one of the longer ones, septal occluder, just to orient uh, our, our colleagues on the webinar. These are uh, a nitinol type of structure. They're completely occluded. They look like a lumen opposing metal stent, but there's no uh, lumen to them. And they elongate. That means if you, that's why I spent a lot of time trying to get the wire out of the ET2 because I wanted to put a snare. And the way that you deploy this is you capture with the snare that, that, that the nipple there and with tension, it elongate and you could pull it through the track under fluoroscopic guidance to align it where you want to align it. And after discussing with thoracic surgery, actually, and our interventional pulmonary group, they said that your best bet, if this is going to work, is to try to align it across the diaphragmatic defect. So this is spanning the diaphragm rather than spanning the cavity. So we, we monkeyed with it for a while to get it there. It was not easy, I could tell you. But finally, we were able, under, uh, under guidance, to and using this wire snare technique, to align it, you could see here the, the diaphragm uh, silhouette to align it just uh, in the bronchial uh, tree across the diaphragm and part of it into the cavity. And then what we did uh, after that is, uh, so here's the aligned, here's the, the uh, phalange in the cavity. This is the diaphragmatic defect through the track and this is the bronchus end of things uh, in alignment. And then what I did is I drained the residual cavity in the abdomen. So hopefully that will collapse it further. And I placed a viable to just isolate this further. So the viable is pushing on the lip of this to try to separate the lung from the, from the abdominal cavity. And, we, and through that, I put a pigtail. So it's kind of a MacGyver the way through with uh, every trick in the book and throwing the kitchen sink. Uh, but what does the panel think so far? So I was going to ask Dr. Ujiki as well um, if he would have, I know he's going to present the next case, but would you have done, would you have, would, would you have just gone straight for surgery or would you have uh, done the MacGyver method? <laughs> yeah, again, it, it's, it's great to see this and it's uh, very creative and I can just tell you again, this has uh, been wonderful to hear uh, everyone's comments on this case. Um, you know, I, I have a similar case coming up and, and we did go right to surgery and, and, you know, that did work pretty well. I, I think, um, I'll be interested to hear how this turns out. And I think, you know, uh, some of the differences are the chronicity here. Uh, this has been a, you know, this is a long time to have a, a fistula. And so as Dr. Kaitan said, I think, you know, staying out of the abdomen, and trying what we can to do first is is uh, our preference. But you know, if this fails, I think surgery is still there. But I think you know, trying this, I, I don't see any problems with uh, going forward and, and hoping that this will work. 
any other comments? Well, I, yeah, this is Eric. So, um, yeah, I mean, we, we don't know if this story is all over. Barham uh, hasn't given us how far uh, this patient's out. Um, uh, you know, Natan talked about foreign bodies and, um, uh, and the foreign body potentially could still be a, a problem with nidus uh, for, for this to continue to progress. You, you've got to figure out whether you've, you've truly stopped the pressure gradient. Now you've got, you know, a, 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 a leak cavity that repressurized, but hopefully Barham's addressed that with the pigtail um, and hopefully there's no distal um, pressure gradient past the bottom of the sleeve or, you know, in the lower part of the sleeve. Um, he didn't talk that much about that, but I'm sure he addressed that. And, uh, and then you've got a pressure gradient now across the lung and the lungs a negative pressure environment. So um, once you get a fistula across the diaphragm, everything gets harder. Um, and so that's why you really want to, when you see these, the learning point of this is when you see these cavities, um, you want to make absolutely sure that cavity is collapsed really, really well, throwing all the tools you can at it, um, including upsizing drains as opposed to necessarily downsizing them and uh, keep the cavity truly decompressed because now you've got a pressure gradient from a positive pressure environment to a negative pressure environment. And you've got to, you've got to drop the pressure in that cavity even that much more in order to keep that gradient from continuing to, to create a leak. Um, so, uh, I'm, I'm curious to see what Barham, uh, will say about this to sum up and, and, and where he thinks it's at now and whether he feels like he's out of the woods yet. Yeah, Barham, I think if I can uh, ask a question as well, what are, people talk about, you know, intracavitary, which wouldn't be suitable here or intraluminal evac, you know, there's a question, uh, from the, attend one of the attendees here about that, you know, uh, have you used that in, in patients who've had a gastrobronchial fistula? Yeah, I, I have a uh, VVEC um, and, and you can create more negative pressure um, than you can in the, in, than the lung often does have. Um, you know, we have a case right now that we're dealing that with and we think we're not convinced, but we think we may have have uh, have solved the problem. But you just don't know. I mean, you think you're you're you may have won these cases and sometimes three months later they come and slap you in the face again. So um, uh it's 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 uh it has worked uh for me in the past um but uh right now we're in the middle of that and we seem like we're in a in a good sh shape but again not for sure certain yet can i say something um we tried a case we had a esophagectomy i have a lewis with a uh, uh dislodge and uh, it created a um more of a gastric um bronchofistula and we tried to use the, the um, the evac it didn't work, but it made it worse actually. Uh, so we end up having to disconnect completely and bring the patient back to do an interposition because it, it, we tried every trick in the book except the septocluder, but everything else just didn't work. And I think it has to do with the pressure. And I, I mean, uh, just to keep respect of time, because I, I want Dr. Yujiki and Vivek to uh, present the next case and give it its time for the next half an hour. So. We'll move this along, but this this is a lesson to keep you humbled. I mean, we really try to do as aggressive of a maneuvers as anybody could do, many short of a very invasive surgery. And actually, Eric is right that uh, the pa uh, the story is not over. The patient did very well actually with these maneuvers. She she stopped having the cough. She was very happy. She was actually resumed oral diet for. Uh, few weeks and then after back after that she came back again with a new new cough and new pneumonia and uh, at that point is we just had to pull the trigger and say failed endoscopic management for this complex uh, patient she did undergo lower low, uh, low uh, low, lower lobe lobectomy with diaphragmatic defect uh, repair she had an esophageal jejunostomy uh, uh, in the process and unfortunately, postoperatively, she leaked from the EJ, and but that was a more favorable leak. At least, did not communicate with the lungs, so we were able to manage it endoscopically with success. But you have to keep humble, and you never declare victory until until it's victory. And uh, it's usually not very obvious until a few weeks or few months that uh, things are working or not working uh, with these things. Barham, now answer Rim question. 
That was the nutrition of the patient because now she licks twice. Uh, I'm not saying that because when you do a reoperation like this one, anything can happen, you know. But well, how was the nutrition of the patient? Because that that that's a chronic leak like this one is a big concern for me. So yeah. Rima did a good question. She's been on TPN throughout, uh, Natan. So her nutrition has always been good because she's been a manager on TPN for a long while. So her nutrition was good. Well, how, how hard was to take the septocluda out uh, surgically? Uh, it was not hard because that's my concern about the septocluders is they really need to build myocytes into them to fibrose in place. So when I, I was there and it's actually you pull on it across the diaphragm and you dislodge it. So uh, it's not, it's, it was not that hard. Yeah, it needs blood as well, right? Uh, that's how they work in the, in the cardiovascularly. But thank you so much. This was an excellent discussion. I think the key take home points is when you have a leak, you throw the kitchen sink, multidisciplinary discussion, um, as, as we've heard, because there are a lot of opinions, but think of the four things, obstruction, infection, foreign body, and, and uh, nutrition status. So with that, um, we'll move on to Dr. Kambari, and uh, you'll uh, take it away. Yeah, th th thanks, Raymond Barham, and the rest of that. that was fascinating. You know, one thing I hope we challenge today is, uh, is throwing the kitchen sink the right thing to do? Uh, it may not be, and, and I hope that's teased out uh, towards the end. And in fact, the fact that Mikey Jiki's case went to surgery potentially earlier on, I'm not sure, about to find out. Uh, maybe he's onto something there. So, so Dr. Ujiki is a professor of surgery. Uh, he's the chair of surgery at the North Shore University Health System. Um, and uh, someone I'm very jealous of because he's not only a, a fantastic surgeon, but also a fantastic endoscopist. Um, so uh, I'm very excited to, uh, to hear your case, Mike. Thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate that. And again, I've been looking forward to this night. This is uh, uh, exciting to get, you know, some of the best in the world here to, to, to pour over these cases and listen to what everybody uh, has to say. So um, I have a, a presentation here of one of my own cases. So um, actually my, my uh, first sleeve leak. So uh, this 33 year old female, she came in with a body mass index of 48, uh, otherwise no medical history. Uh, and she, we elected to go forward with the sleeve gastrectomy. And she went uh, through this without any problems. Uh, July 23rd, it was uneventful. Uh, she went home a couple days later uh, after an uneventful course. And um, uh, she, was on, uh, she was on some chronic narcotics um, and, and so I think that, you know, she did have a little bit more pain than we would expect. And perhaps we underappreciated what was to come, but, uh, so that's the reason for the extra day stay, I think. Uh, but in any, how she went home and, um, about a week later, she came back with fevers, abdominal pain, and she had a, um, uh, an abscess, as you can see here, uh, this is part of it, but she had a, a seven and a half centimeter abscess. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy to do this the way Barham did, or I could just go through the case. Uh, what, what would you like? Uh, yeah, if, uh, depending on how long, how drawn out this is, uh, if it's particularly drawn out, maybe we'll get you to shoot through the case. But if uh, it's about the same length of Barham, we can sort of do the same thing and interject along the way. Yeah, I think we should have interjections. Okay, yeah. So what I, you know, happy to stop here to see what others would do. So you've got a patient who likely has a sleeve leak, and, um, you know, how would you, uh, uh, you know, she's not septic, uh, but she is febrile um, and she's got this seven and a half centimeter abscess. Yeah, L Lena, did you, did you have any thoughts? Um, acute sleeve leak, seven centimeter abscess. Yeah, well, the first thing is the stability of the patient. It sounds like from what Mike has said, uh, she's stable. So that opens up a lot of options uh, because um, if a patient's unstable, I think, you know, surgery is uh, a place to go um, or uh, at least a strong consideration. So, so now we can say, okay, well, we got some options, whether we're going to manage this endoscopically or surgically. Um, these patients are all obese. Going back in surgically uh, early is uh, oftentimes a challenge, um, but the key things you want to look at is uh, what was discussed with the last case. So we want to look at the pressure 
um, in the area? And is there a pressure holding this open? And we want to control the contamination. So this needs some sort of drainage. And uh, at least where the leak is right there, I don't, I don't know how amenable that would be to uh, IR drainage. Um, uh, can't, certainly can't go through the spleen. The liver seems quite uh, generous. Um, I, I don't know if there's any place you can sneak in there uh, or if it goes over the spleen, but in my experience, whenever um, these abscesses go over the spleen and against the diaphragm, radiology always seeds the chest and then your next step is an empyema. So I, I prefer to avoid IR for, for a lot of those if I can. So this might be a, a reasonable um, uh, case to do an endoscopic uh, drainage of some kind and then uh, try, try to drain it. And if there's a distal obstruction, uh, endoscopically try to uh, relieve that in some way as well. So those are kind of the things that I'm thinking about for this case. Yeah, Manola uh, Gavau, I'd love your, your thoughts here. So we have an acute leak here, potentially a cavity that's not mature or well-organized. Um, you know, what are your thoughts about uh, internal drainage? So the, thanks, Vivek. In a traditional way, the traditional school is to uh, find a window, drain it uh, by intervention of radiology or laparoscopy, and, and then put the stent. Uh, in our case, we, we have available the bariatric stent. So that's traditionally. And uh, as uh, quite some of you guys uh, are very well versed in uh, endosonography, I, I'm seeing that a trend on endosonography to be much more aggressive nowadays. So uh, if you don't find, uh, meaning if you don't find the, the leak site uh, that you can do anything, you just can do an endosonography and puncture, enlarge and drain that. Uh, so that will be solve everything by endoscopy. Uh, or you can go to the French school if you find a hole just leave a pigtail drain, doesn't matter if wallet or not. That raised to me some concerns that the guide wire can go in fresh inflamed tissue with vessels that can be heated. So, uh, and I'll answer a question, don't, don't, don't get me wrong. I will go for a bariatric stent with some sort of sternal drainage. Vivek. Uh, with, with a heavy in hands right now. Vivek, I, I have a comment, you know, I, I, I like Lina's comment, but if the patient is stable, uh, I will do my best to do it percutaneously. They will find a window. You, we need to be careful because in some of the pericardial and pleural and bronchial fistulas we've seen, they were doing through percutaneous drain. So Lina is totally correct there. But the problem is when surgeons go to surgery, they don't drain. They have the tendency to wash, to make the patient sick, to put stitches where you shouldn't put stitches. So if you convince a surgeon to put a drain, just remove the pus and leave, that's the surgeon I will invite. But the one who's gonna wash out everything, move everything, and then the patient leaves sick like a dog, I, I don't like that one. You know, that's what I think if you can do it percutaneously, nobody's gonna do more damage there. In, 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 in. I appreciate that, uh, Natan, but I, I think surgically, my goal would be just to put a drain in it. You know, you know, you can only do so much and you know, a stitch isn't going to hold there anywhere. So, um, so I, I would uh, just put some drains in there and then um, put a stent from the inside to try to stop the ongoing leak, kind of a combination laparoscopic endoscopic approach. Uh, just a quick question for Chris. Chris, you know, we, we are taught not to drain acute fluid collections endoscopically uh, because they don't have a mature wall. Um, wh why are we suddenly comfortable now draining these perigastric fluid collections, which also are, are not mature internally? Yeah, you know, I, I still do prefer for these immature collections, the external drainage, and I do try the, uh, you know, the esophageal cover esophageal stance. That's still my approach, but um, you know, I have been a little more brave, even with pancreatic necrosectomy a little bit when they're not fully walled off and they seem to do okay. Depends on how you're managing their diet. 
uh, but I, I'm doing that very selectively. And my uh, my standard approach is as as what Man Manuel had said is you know do external drainage in this case and, and try to try to try to cover it up. Go ahead, Mike. Let's uh, see what you did. Okay, so um, we did take her to the operating room, but for endoscopy. And um, um, what we found was not unexpected, not a large hole, but our goals during the endoscopy was to make sure there wasn't a distal obstruction has been brought up many times already this evening. Um, and and uh, we did not see one. So that was the whole, um, I kind of broke up the videos to hear, but um, I, I poked through there because I could see that there was hematoma as you see here. So I made the hole a little bit bigger with the plan to try to endovac this area and see if I could get source control uh, with the vac. Uh, as you can see, it was very difficult to um, get the uh, hematoma um, you know, suctioned free. Um, so my hope was uh, that we could potentially get control with an endovac here. So I did have to make the perforation a little bit bigger. I brought the endovac sponge down and, um, and, and placed that uh, endovac on suction. And, um, and, and that was it. Uh, she, we got source control. She actually um, improved her fevers, uh, uh, went away. And, and she started to show some improvement over the next couple of days. So we never got septic, she did okay. Um, I have video later showing there's no distal obstruction or any problems with the sleeve. Um, so vac exchange two days later, or uh, maybe we can stop here and just uh, see what people think about, maybe just a quick comment on vacs. Yeah, um, any comments uh, from the from the panel? I've had very little experience. Uh, Eric, you mentioned you, you're, yeah. you're in the process of one now. Yeah, so we've used Vax both acutely and chronically. You know, um, Stephen Leeds is, has probably got the largest series of using them acutely and kind of halting sepsis with them. You just have to, it takes some work, and Mike can probably testify to this. It takes some work to get it in the right position in an acute setting like this. And and getting it to drag into the cavity is always a little bit of a challenge. Um, we've, uh, we've, we've changed that out with some chronic leaks to, to a percutaneous approach where you get a guide wire in with a drain and then you're, you're pu putting the back, back in um, uh, across a, 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 a gastrostomy tube or an NG tube that uh, you've put over the guide wire and that way the, the, the vac's out of the patient's, out of the, there's, there's nothing in their nose, it's coming out percutaneously. Um, that's a little bit of a different approach, but, uh, um, they do work. Uh, you have to get them in the right place and you have to keep them under suction. They're a, a lot of work because you have to change them out pretty frequently. If you don't, uh, um, the sponge will start to degrade over time. And so, um, uh, but they can, they can just like a stent. If you get the, the cavity depressurized really well, um, it will, it will stop in an early situation. It can stop sepsis as, as uh, Mike just showed, I, I'm interested in in knowing if there's concern about hemorrhage with the with the vac, uh, considering there was already kind of clots in the cavity, and what your thoughts were regarding that. Yeah, yeah, I mean that's a good question. Uh, you know, we didn't see any active bleeding, and I really, it, it, you know, in retrospect, at the time of her sleeve, we did have to place a couple clips along the staple line. Um, I didn't use reinforcement uh, at, at all. And there was a little bit of oozing from the staple line that we had to clip. And I suspect that that's what that was from. So I don't think that this was a short gastric bleed or anything like that. So her hemoglobin was not low. Um, and, and, but, you know, certainly I hear you and that, that, that could be a concern, but uh, we got the sponge just out uh, into the cavity, um, no visible blood vessels nearby. And so I was not concerned that we were gonna cause any bleeding with the back at all. And, you know, knowing that we're going to be back in a couple of days to look and see how we're doing, I felt comfortable doing that. And as Eric said, you know, what, one of the things I learned in this case in particular, I've used the VAC for our esophagectomies in the past with great success, actually. Um, uh, but for, uh, you know, the sleeve leak, this is the first time I've used it for a sleeve leak. And I actually consulted Steve and Mark Ward at the time of this procedure. Um, and they really convinced me that it's a great way to get source control and prevent sepsis and, and get quick healing actually of a, of a sleeve leak because they have a very large experience with uh, using EVAC for sleeve leaks. Um, one of the things I learned is small, make the sponge small. If you make it too big, you have a difficult time getting it out into the cavity. 
And, and so the first vac placement, I had a rather big sponge and I think I got a portion of it out, but a lot of it was still in the stomach. Um, uh, the vac exchange I'm gonna show here, used a little smaller sponge and was able to kind of give it, get it out into the cavity. So I'll go ahead and just show that. But, um, you know, so when we took the uh, vac out, we were left with, um, you know, this, this is the hole. And I was just a little bit discouraged that, uh, you know, inside we, we hadn't really made a lot of progress in terms of evacuating the hematoma. Uh, so there was still quite a bit of, um, of, of hematoma, as you'll see, I think here. Um, and so I didn't feel like, you know, she, she was uh, absolutely stable, no problems, you know, no fevers, but, you know, I haven't really made progress at, at all with the EVAC, but I did um, uh, decide to give it one more uh, chance. And so we did place uh, uh, another VAC and, um, and then brought her back in, in, in a couple of days. So th this is the uh, placement. As I said before, I think if you make the sponge, you know, not too big, you're able to get it out into that cavity better. I think you'll see it kind of go down on suction now and, 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 and work pretty well in, in this scenario. So, um, you know, she obviously hated having the NG tube. That was one problem. Um, and uh, so I had to kind of convince her that, you know, we're going to uh, see how much progress we're making, but I wasn't going to prolong things. And, and indeed that's what happened. So, you know, I brought her back for her second, um, uh, you know, this would be now uh, six days after she presented after uh, two VAC exchanges um, or two VAC placements. And on the second VAC exchange really felt like I hadn't made any progress. And so what I did is uh, laparoscopically place a drain um, and washed out as much of the hematoma as I could. And then I stented her. And she actually did very well after this. Uh, she was out of the hospital in about four days, eating um, and with the drain in place and doing well. Uh, she came back a month later uh, to clinic and was doing very well. And um, we uh, decided to take the stent out. She had actually no side effects, by the way, from the stent. I worry, and I've had experience in the past where you're stenting in the proximal you know, stomach or the distal esophagus, you get bad reflux disease. And I was worried that she was gonna get bad reflux uh, you know, with a sleeve gastrectomy, which already makes you prone to reflux. Uh, she had zero reflux, she felt great, she had no problem. So I, I really felt good about this. And, and um, as Barnum had talked about in the case before, I felt like we had victory because we took the stent out, um, repeated a floral study, uh, there was no leak. Uh, her drain came out, and I thought we were done. Um, she, Mike, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, the stent, you know, what strategies did you use to uh, keep it from migrating? Yeah, I, I almost always suture the stents in place with the uh, overstitch. Uh, I put three sutures in, um, and uh, I, I almost, you know, I, I would say that in the past we might put two sutures and when we went back to take it out, they were both gone, but with three sutures, usually at least one is still intact. And we've seen very few uh, migrations uh, with suturing it in place. Great, thanks. So uh, we, we removed the stent uh, uh, about a month later, as I said, and uh, she was doing great until a month after that. And she came back to the hospital and she had this really bad nausea to the point that she was not really able to tolerate anything orally. Uh, we, we repeated CT scans, uh, repeated floral studies, and, and did not find anything. Uh, I wound up taking her back to the GI lab and did another endoscopy just to look to see if we're missing something and did not find anything. Um, we, play, we placed a Dobhoff tube at the time of the endoscopy and actually were able to, was able to get her some nutrition for about two days through the Dobhoff while still allowing her to eat, and she got better. Uh, so we felt like, not sure why she's nauseated, but maybe we broke the cycle with the Dobhoff tube and she was able to start eating. We actually took the Dobhoff out, sent her home, and she did well. But a month later, she presented with a uh, recurrent leak. And, um, and here, here, here's the, uh, you know, here's a video of that case. So there's the GE junction. And again, just to show that there's no... Uh, uh, distal obstruction, 
um, you know, I included this. That's actually not, not the area of the leak. You'll see it a little bit more distal. I think that's the most proximal staple line of the sleeve. That's the area of the, the leak right there. And you really don't see much. It looks okay. But there was a recurrent abscess in the, around the spleen in the same place as before. Um, and so she, we clearly knew that she was still leaking. But as you can see here, I mean, the sleeve looks okay. I mean, there's no, you know, there, there's no distal obstruction and, um, you know, everything, you know, looks open. So I could not figure out why, you know, almost two months after stent removal, you know, why is she having a recurrent leak now? And it was a little bit um, uh, disappointing. Um, so at this point, um, you know, I, I guess I would, I kind of went forward a little bit, but I guess I would leave it to, to, to the rest of the group to talk about what they would do in this case. Mike, I, I, I have this personal opinion with no data, you know, so, but <laughs> we do that. We, we're not pushing anybody to do it, but we do that. I think even if you don't have obstruction, even if you don't have a stricture, high pressure is a form of obstruction. So that's what I believe much in dilations all the time, because while the stent is in place and it holds the lumen, the pressure is down. Mm -hmm. While it's gone, the pressure is still up. It doesn't matter you don't have any stricture. The, the studies in the sleeve that show high pressure is without the strictures, without obstruction. So the high pressure is there. So that's what I like dilation most of the time. So when, as Manuel mentioned, you do septotomy, you are dilation. Sometimes you put the stents, you do dilations. Uh, so that, that's what I think, you know, that's what they coming back. Eric mentioned it. We've seen patients going and coming back and coming back for 12 months, 14 months, every two, three months. So it's not your case, it's everybody's. Mm -hmm. So there should be a reason that we don't understand. Well, I think it's the pressure, but that's me, so. Well, so along those lines, I mean, should we be considering, you know, Botox or pyloromyotomies in everybody? You see, we started at the beginning. I don't know, Manuel is here. He's a witness because he, you know, he's the, one of the ones who started very early this. We dilated the pylorus before at the beginning, more than the whole system. And then we were criticized because, oh, you are destroying now the sleep. You know, when you handle a complication as severe as this one, the weight loss is not important anymore, you know. The, 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 the health of the patient, the safety of the patient is more important. Botox I haven't tried, but probably it works. But I, I'm happy now with the Akalisha balloon dilation, you know, but, but I, I don't think it's a bad thing doing a dilation of the pylorus or Botox. I don't see it as a bad thing. Yeah, so I'd like to add to what Natanya said. I mean, um, you know, Manuel convinced me with septotomy, and I know he's going to talk about it later. He convinced me with septotomy, the value of it, and I started to buy into it. And then he's like, you've got to dilate too. And so then we start using these achalasia balloons, and we start using 30s and 35s on the inside shira. And it just shocked me the number of times I would see a waste at the inside shira when, you, when, you, when you'd inflate the balloon. And, and uh, patients, even with reflux, when you start doing it for reflux purposes, you'll find that the inside shira is – more commonly narrow than uh, people think. And uh, um, what looks like it wouldn't be obstructed at all actually does have some functional obstruction periodically. So, you know, I'm much more liberal about looking at the inside shear with an achalasia balloon. Um, I would go up to 35. I was going up to, to um, 40 millimeter achalasia balloons until Manuel told me to stop. Um, and I didn't have a problem with using 40s, luckily, but uh, he advised me that's not a good idea. So I stopped, but, but if they waste with a 35 balloon then I'm, and they have a leak, um, then I'm thinking very seriously that maybe I need to dilate that more aggressively. So, um, you can put contrast and you can, you can do it hydrostatically, you can do it pneumatically, but you can see it, it wastes. And if it wastes, it probably is tight. Um, and that's probably creating some of the pressure gradient. Um, and it seems to, to help a lot. I, I wonder if Manuel would want to comment on that. Uh, uh, if, I, if I might, uh, gentlemen and ladies and everybody, uh, it's for you, Nathan. Uh, uh, <laughs> about, about the pylorus, uh, uh, you, you guys know I'm, I'm a plumber that went to the medical school. So thinking like a plumber that went to a medical school, how in hell can we damage the innervation of the 
pylorus by doing a sleeve gastrectomy that the latter nerve is on the left side near, or is near the liver. So the pylorus is doing his job. It's not guilty of anything. And by the way, there are two compartments of pressure. One is the, the body and the other is the entrum. So uh, I don't think that is value on uh, putting Botox or just, just dilate the pylorus. So getting on what Nathan said is that when we dilate pneumatic dilation, pylorus is an innocent on this war. And sometimes in the war, innocent people die. So if we have to do a good dilation, the pylorus on the way, it will be dilated. But just Botoxing is just see you are doing, sorry, you're doing nothing. And we, uh, just team, we, we have five minutes left for this case. So uh, if we could forge ahead, that'd be fantastic. Sure. So at this point, because it, I'm not, it's not even clear that there's a hole, but as you can see, there is. And, and uh, getting a wire into that cavity um, uh, was, was, was fairly simple. And so at this point, um, you know, a, a double J tube uh, uh, was placed here. And, and I'll just show that. Um, I, I thought this case was interesting because basically we utilize almost every method that you can uh, to treat this leak. And, and I would just say that um, ultimately um, this, in addition to a, a, a J-tube um, laparoscopically placed, uh, worked. Now she did at the same time of this admission uh, show herself to have a, a fistula uh, to the bronchus and uh, thoracic surgery came in and cleaned that out. Um, and uh, did it minimally invasively with a VATS, um, and, and she ultimately recovered. But it took a few months, um, and, and this stent was removed, and she, did, and she is now she, uh, you know, about four months out from the double J removal and, and IR drain removal uh, and J-tube removal doing okay, and, and fingers are crossed uh, that, that uh, she won't be back again, but so far, um, you know, that, that was how this case was managed. Uh, can, can I ask a question um, to, to the panel? Uh, the double pigtails, do you ever take them out? Can you just leave them in forever? Uh, there's several schools of thought here. Uh, some people say exchanging them every four weeks is good because it sort of irritates the track and, and may encourage closure. What, what are the team's thoughts here? I do as, as Lina mentioned before. I remove it very slowly. I think that, that that comment from Lina was very important. You know, every time you exchange them, you undo what you were trying to do. That they uh, uh, try to close that fistula, that tragic, by epitalization. That's what you're doing. So if you let them epitalize or whatever, because I don't speak English, if you allow that to happen, then that will close. So so I think removing it slowly. That will work, but that, that, that Lina comedy was pretty good for me. I think you leave them in until the body forces them out, basically. I mean, it's a yeah. secondary intention is what you're trying to achieve. And so um, you, you leave them. I mean, I'm about to show a slide. That's the last thing I pull out after I've had a, a bad leak is my drain. It's the very last thing and they're doing perfectly. Um, this is an example if I have a percutaneous drain or something else like that. Um, but if it's an endoluminal drain, it's really the same principle. It's the last thing that comes out. And uh, most of the time, the body will probably force it out. Um, but, you know, it might get stuck if it's a pigtail. But if it's completely collapsed and there's nothing behind it and you can prove that with a CAT scan, then I'd think about taking it out at that point. But in your office, one thing you can, you can do on, on, yeah, on that direction, Vivek, and uh, uh, we have to learn from the father. The father is Gianfranco Donatelli. Uh, Italian that lives in France. So what he does, he, uh, not that case, uh, uh, Mike, because there's no space. So what he does, he puts three or four pigtails. So he remove each month, he remove one. So if you if you will go in the direction of, of putting the cavities smaller, that's a very good way to go. Uh, instead of being removing one and replacing. Okay. Idea. Yeah. I think the other message for, for, the, for the audience is that you can do an endoscopy within days of surgery. Uh, both Barham and Mike used caps with the endoscope to sort of pry the, the, the tissue to, to identify the fold. 
and also I think helps with optimizing suction and sometimes just suctioning the staple line will actually cause a bit of pus to come into the field of view and that's where you know where your leak is. Um, but I think we, we're at time here so uh, I'll hand over to uh, uh, the, uh, the, the rest of the team. But thanks Mike awesome. for the next case. Excellent job, uh, Dr. Kumbari, uh, with moderation. Excellent job from the panel. Lots of wisdom uh, here. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Sharaiha, for, uh, for also excellent moderation. The key is you could see that these could tend to be complex, and you have to be humbled by how complex they are and that the approach should be multidisciplinary. And we might fail endoscopically, and we have to be nimble when that happens to do what's the right thing for the patient and work as a team to get uh, the situation taken care of. With that, we're gonna move to the next block, which is the didactic block. Again, this is designed to start with case presentation to illustrate some of these concepts, then have a didactics uh, kind of uh, rapid fire uh, lectures that are very clinically relevant, eight minutes each, uh, to uh, discuss the different facets of management of sleep leaks. And then hopefully in the third section, Dr. Galva will put it all together for us in state-of-the-art presentation, and then we'll talk about the algorithm. So we're gonna move to the next block. Uh, we would like to stay on time, please. So I would ask the speaker to have uh, eight minutes each for their talk. We'll start with Dr. Eric Wilson. Uh, Eric, if you wanna start pulling up your slides. Uh, Dr. Wilson is a professor of uh, surgery uh, and vice chair of surgery at UT Houston. Uh, he is a brilliant surgeon and also a brilliant endoscopist and innovator uh, in the field. Uh, he needs no further introduction. And with that, I will uh, give him the form to talk about stents and endoscopic suturing uh, of, uh, of leak uh, management. You're muted, Eric. Sorry, I had to unmute. Yeah. Just a second. All right, cool. All right, uh, thanks, Barham, and uh, feel free to kick me off if I'm running long. But I'll, I'll I'll try to go quick. Obviously, we've been talking about all these options, and there's just tons of them out there for management of of leaks. Um, but uh, you know, I'm supposed to briefly talk about uh, um, stents and in suturing. But getting back to you know what we've been talking about for the last you know. Um, Hour, it's really about you know uh, this this uh, process of thinking about the leak as is it contained because if it's not contained, there's sep and you can first. You really don't want to pursue a lot of further surgery at this point to to uncontain it because your body's contained it, but then you've got to drain it and you've got to drain it really well and you got to depressurize it. Um, so, you know, a free leak sometimes requires surgery, um, or something more aggressive because you've got to, you've got to contain it, um, and wash it out, um, monitor the Sears response, the stronger the Sears response, Sears response, the faster you must move because the less likely it's contained and you got to drain it. Um, and there's all different ways to drain it. Um, people have talked about IR, people have talked about endoscopic drainage. I think they both have roles. Um, and, uh, but if you, if you can't get it adequately drained, then you've got to go to surgery to do that. And like Natan said, uh, and has been talked about already, you've got to be thinking about nutrition very early on when you know, you've got a leak. So, um, uh, stents, I really think they're valuable at the beginning early on. This is an old Galvo video, but, uh, you know, they they have a lot of value, um, early on uh, in covering up the hole. Um, I use them selectively. I don't stint just every leak that comes in because some of these leaks are small. And if you just make the patient NBO and uh, manage them with antibiotics, they'll depressurize that small cavity themselves. Sometimes you need to, to drain them, but a stint can be helpful. And if they're in the OR, then like Lena was talking about, sometimes it makes sense in an early situation to stint. But my main point, and I think this will be said by most people here, is stenting has very little utility um, in the long-term leak. It's really about the early leak. Um, and what you're doing is covering the hole and you're releasing the pressure, oftentimes the pressure at the incisura. So you want that stent across the incisura most of the time, and you're trying to correct the axis there. Um, it can be useful in reducing sepsis and um, can help on occasion with possible early 
earlier oral intake. Um, but what I would say is stents is in general, when we put stents in, a lot of people, and some people might argue about this on the panel, but I think most of the time stents, they're going to do what they do in two to three weeks. They don't need to stay in for a long period of time. So be really thinking about that. What you're doing with the stent um, is probably going to have its effect in two to three weeks. And because of that, I tend to use partially covered stents um, because they migrate less. Um, fully covered stents migrate more and you can suture them in, which gets to the endoluminal suturing, which reduces migration as Mike has already talked about. But I use partially covered stents. They ingrow very well, but you can take them out in two to three weeks very easily um, with uh, not a lot of, of challenges. But you leave them in longer than three weeks, they get quite a quite a challenge to take out, but they just migrate less. Um, strutted stents provide more radial pressure if you're having to deal with a, you know, a, a tight pressure situation, but they also provide pressure when you may not want a lot of pressure. So most of the time when I'm covering leaks, I use non-strutted stents. Um, if I'm trying to erode something, then I'll use a strutted stent. Of course, if you leave a stent in long enough um, and it has a high enough radial pressure, it will erode things, including the aorta. And this is an old you know, um, uh, that would be a really bad, bad problem that's probably mortal in most patients. So what about suturing? I think suturing is obviously cool, but we talked about uh, when you take the patient to the OR with a sleeve leak, we're putting, uh, um, you know, sutures on a sleeve um, hole and it just doesn't work. So if it works so well, you know, um, we'd be doing it a lot laparoscopically and uh, we're basically not not doing that hardly at all. So it doesn't work well unless the tract is extremely mature with no residual acute inflammation um, or if it's extremely early, um, like you caught the leak or you perforated the patient right then and there. That's a potential option for, for suturing. If you're in a highly inflammatory area um, and the stage of the leak where there's still a lot of inflammation, um, suturing is probably not going to do much, um, but it is good for suturing stents. Um, and I think we can just discuss this uh, later. So, so, you know, uh, to summarize, um, since we're doing this quickly, think pressure, where's the pressure? How can I relieve the pressure? You want to drain to the lowest pressure that's either inside the gut or outside the body. But like Lena said, you don't want to go through the chest. Um, because that's a low pressure system as well. Um, stents or suturing can reduce the influx pressure. So you can use that to reduce pressure into a leak cavity. But if you have an undrained collection behind that leak cavity, in that leak cavity behind that stent or behind your closure, that's going to repressurize with uh, infected bacteria. And so my ultimate goal with all of these is a permanently collapsed, obliterated drain cavity. It's obliterated with scar. You can't refill the cavity with contrast or anything else. That's the ultimate goal. So like I said, my drains are the last thing to come out when a patient's doing, and they come out when the patient's doing great on, on solid food and feeling well. And with that, I'll stop and move on to the next. Fantastic job, Dr. Wilson. I will hand it to Lena to present our next speaker. So the message yes, here. Can, go oh, go ahead. No, please. Sorry, I, I jumped the gun. You're up. <laughs> so the uh, I think this the summary here is uh, uh, what well, is that uh, stents have use, but early on in the course of the leak, when there is a cavity they really should have very little role and there is no reason to subject the patient uh, through their risk and discomfort. Patients are miserable with these stents uh, in place. Uh, all right, so next is uh, we, it's a distinct honor and pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Ali yeah. Shulman. Yeah, uh, Ali. Lina, you're, you're, you're supposed to introduce Dr. Shulman. That's right, I'll have Ali bring up her uh... Uh, slides. Um, Allie is an associate uh, professor of surgery at University of Michigan. Um, she's the director of bariatric endoscopy there. Um, uh, she's young in her career and has accomplished so much. She's really established herself as a leader in this uh, bariatric endoscopy arena. And we're so lucky to have her here with us uh, this evening. And she's going to talk to us about the pigtails that uh, a lot of our 
um, panelists have discussed earlier this evening. And so really excited to hear about Allie's expert opinion. Thank you so much um, for the invitation to speak today. Um, I'm honored to be here and be presenting on this topic. Um, so as you heard, I was asked to give a talk on sleeve leak management with passive internal drainage with pigtail stents. Um, these are my disclosures. Um, so all of us are familiar um, with these. There are several different types of plastic stents available for both biliary and pancreatic procedures. Um, but the ones that are preferred for internal drainage are those with the two pigtailed components. Um, and these come in different lengths, different diameters. Um, some are made of hard or soft plastic um, and all have really different delivery systems. But importantly, all of them, as you can see in this image, have these side holes along the pigtailed component to facilitate drainage. And for the management of sleeve leaks, um, these plastic pigtail stents are placed between the gastric lumen and the perigastric cavity, as you can see in this schematic. And so as far as I could tell, this was really first reported in 2011 in the treatment of a gastrobronchial fistula. Um, but the general goal, as we've discussed throughout this webinar so far, is really to achieve internal drainage and promote granulation and epithelialization of the perigastric cavity. And the size of the leak orifice and the cavity really dictate the size and the number of pigtail stents that should be placed. And so generally we're placing stents that are seven French or 10 French um, in diameter and usually between one and three, depending on the leak size. And the largest available data is from a retrospective study um, from several years ago, which included 67 patients with sleeve leaks. Um, the average time of leak development was 52 days and following serial plastic pigtail stent placement, technical success was quite high at 98.5% and clinical success was also close to 80%. And interestingly, um, compared to self-expanding metal stents, um, these have much lower morbidity and mortality and require fewer procedures for leak healing. Um, and they're also very easy to place with high technical success, even in suboptimal locations. And so these are just two examples of leaks, um, which are from actually the past two or three weeks, um, which were drained percutaneously and in which we attempted primary closure. However, the leaks were either in suboptimal locations or surrounded by suboptimal mucosa. And so closure was really not feasible. Um, placement of plastic pigtail stents in each of these um, cases was really invaluable in providing internal drainage. And so on the left, you can see a large leak, um, but its location is in the very proximal proximal stomach, requiring nearly full retroflexion of the scope in a really tight space. And so only really the distal portion of the leak could be effectively sutured closed, and the proximal leak could not be easily intervened upon. And so we ended up placing a plastic, uh, plastic pigtail stent um, to allow internal drainage, which worked quite well. Um, and on the right, you can see a leak that is surrounded by very edematous and irritated tissue, um, just like Eric mentioned. And we did not feel the tissue integrity was satisfactory for closure. And so again, we opted to place a plastic pigtail stent, which ultimately helped um, with closure of this leak. And so as far as for most leaks, um, the question should always be sort of when is this device or um, intervention used in the algorithm of sleep leak management. And so it's important to think about it as it relates to both timing and chronicity. Um, so i.e. is it acute or early um, versus late or chronic? Um, and also the complexity or size of the leak. So is it associated with an intra-abdominal abscess? Are there fistula to other locations? And so when we think about timing and chronicity of pigtail stents, or sorry, of, of sleeve leaks, um, pigtail stents are traditionally used in late or chronic leaks um, with a walled off cavity. And so as I mentioned earlier, um, the mechanism is really to facilitate drainage and ultimately collapse of the cavity into the gastric lumen. And so as Dr. Thompson has always taught, um, the premise behind this intervention and the technique used for placement is very similar to necrosectomy for walled off necrosis. And so here you can see a large um, peri uh, pancreatic collection on the cross-sectional imaging on the left. And on the right, you can see how we typically approach um, these lesions by placing these stents between the gastric lumen and the collection. Um, and of course, this method is now performed in a single step um, using the lumen opposing metal stent whenever possible. But historically, this has required a series of steps. And so here you can see it's EUS access with wire placement, and then you're dilating the cystostrostomy track. Um, you basically are driving into the collection um, and debriding the necrotic material and removing it into the gastric lumen. And then eventually, once the debridement is complete, um, you're placing the several uh, pigtail stents via the cystostrostomy site for continued drainage. 
And here you can see this technique um, sort of extrapolated to sleeve leaks. Um, so you would drive your scope into the cavity, consider instilling contrast to delineate the size or antibiotics if appropriate. And then you can go into the cavity and debride the cavity, remove any foreign material, which could interfere with healing, as we discussed in the first case, um, and lead potentially to infection. Um, and then you can ultimately pass wires into the, care, into the cavity, and then these plastic pigtail stents over those wires. And so here's the, what this looks like by um, video. Um, and this is a video actually taken from um, when I worked with Dr. Thompson several years ago, but I think it so clearly demonstrates this technique. Um, as we've discussed, dilation of the distal stomach is always important um, to help with leak management. So you see hydrostatic dilation of the pylorus um, for what it's worth, and then a pneumatic dilation of the incisura. Um, and then we come up to the top of the leak area and you can see that we're actually exploring the leak cavity with this ultra slim scope. And here you can see a lot of food debris um, and other material, which is effectively removed, just similar to that necrosoc necrosectomy approach that I just showed. And now the cavity is entirely clean um, and you can place these plastic pigtail stents to really help um, with internal drainage and epithelialization or granulation of that perigastric cavity. And you can see this is done under both um, endoscopic guidance and also commonly fluoroscopic guidance as well, um, which you'll see in just a minute. And so more recently, plastic pigtail stents have been um, increasingly used and become more popular in early and acute leaks. Um, and this has certainly been my own practice, um, but it's important in this context to not um, aggressively inject contrast because there's really no wall to contain that contrast and the patient can quickly develop um, peritonitis or sepsis. And this is especially true um, because if there's no percutaneous access into the cavity. And of course, you also wanna be very careful about selecting what size pigtail stent you use and you don't want to overfit the cavity in any way. And then finally, the size and complexity of the leak um, also plays a role in whether plastic pigtail um, stent placement is appropriate or the appropriate choice. And so I typically use this for leaks that are associated with some intra-abdominal abscess um, as seen in B or C, um, as tinier leaks tend to be better served by primary closure techniques. Um, however, as we saw in um, Barham's original case video, um, when the cavity is very large, internal drainage will likely not work as the pigtail stents will just fall out. And so in that situation, you may want to consider some of the other modalities that have been discussed. So in summary, um, internal drainage with plastic pigtail stents has many advantages. Um, it's technically very easy with high success rates. Um, it's feasible even in leaks with very suboptimal locations. Um, it seems to require fewer procedures than some of the other stenting procedures. Um, it can be used in early or late leaks, um, small or large leaks, and really with low morbidity. Um, however, it may be challenging when the leak openings are large or wide as the stents may migrate. Thank you very much. Fantastic job. Thank you, Ali, for a phenomenal lecture and uh, keep up the awesome work that you're doing. Uh, next, we will uh, go to uh, Dr. Uh, Andrea Teixeira from Orlando Health. Dr. Teixeira is also a superstar in uh, bariatric surgery and endoscopy. Uh, he is an innovator. He does multiple trials in the field, and it's, uh, it's think, honor, and pleasure to have him talk about using vacuum therapy for uh, sleeve uh, leak management. Thank you for the invite. I'll try to be brief here and go straight to the my, <clears throat> my talk. So this is the uh, EVAC or EMPT or vacuum therapy, ETC. There's so many different names now. Uh, they hopefully one day we just come up with one name for this new um, innovative procedure that came from um, the vacuum treatment of um, social sites or wounds uh, for the Omega. Um, one of the mechanisms of action, right, we tried to figure out was uh, micro deformation or micro deformation, which you kind of clean up uh, the, the, the wound with the paper that was um, published, discovered that by the, Dr. Thompson, changes in perfusion. Accelerate control in bacterial clearance, just like what we're trying to do with any lavage, or we try to do a septotomy with a uh, dilation of a, a, a sleeve leak uh, to be able to clean up everything. Uh, same thing, just the, the different mechanisms that try to create the negative pressure to kind of bring the, the wound closer and faster uh, to heal. Um, the problem is, it comes is the sponges, right? So when you look at this um, uh, slide here, um, the, 
that kind of depicts a little bit of the position of this, the sponge, the original technique that was developed was using the, the, the black sponge or even the white sponge. Sometimes we use that in our service until we've learned a new technique, which I'll show you in a few minutes. Um, it's a little bit more cumbersome, uh, I think, to look at, to, to put these big sponges. And, and when you take it out, sometimes some pieces of sponges can stay back in, in there. Depends on how long you, you, you leave the sponge in, you have to take those patients back every couple of days or so to exchange the sponge and put a new one in. Um, when you look at that, the endoscopic vacuum therapy, stippling and leaks off the sleeve, uh, one of the original papers was eight patients on it. And they did pretty well, the 87% um, uh, resolution of the issue uh, with about 19 um, day of hospitalization. So it's not, some people say that sleep, um, sponge usage or the vac uh, is a little bit more cost effective. It depends because sometimes those patients stay longer. You have to take it multiple times to the endoscopy to exchange them. Uh, and this is Flaubert I one of the paper. Is the original um, actually the original uh, endoscopist in Brazil that developed uh, or modifying the original technique. Um, and he's, been, he's a very humble guy. And he, this is the, one of the first one that uh, paper that actually was his name on it. And he talked about eight patients and they had no complications using the modified EVAC therapy. The treatment days went from seven to 60 days. So there's a wide variety. And that comes the issue, right? Is that when do we use the, the VAX? Is, is it smaller um, cavities, bigger cavities, complete disruption of the staple line or not, when to use it, acute, chronic. So that's what we try on this forum here in the webinar, trying to develop hopefully a little more of a pathway in when to, to use those um, devices that you already been talking, the stent, the pigtail, the vac, and so forth. And then um, there was a, a, a one of the first paper that was published recently uh, by Baham Abudai. They try to kind of delineate a little bit when to, to use this uh, endoscopic treatment, right? When you look at um, the algorithm that he developed uh, with the other people, <coughs> they tried to look at repeat endoscopies in three to seven days, uh, if you pay reevaluation, precision sepsis, or repeat laparoscopy. Uh, if you have that endoscopic um, suction device or endoscopic um, percussion therapy, uh, with a sponge or stents, stents you have to re re every four weeks on, on their service or so three or four weeks, it depends on when they they, they tend to uh, reposition and rescope those patients. Uh, I tend to rescope my patients and sometimes take the stent out between, uh, usually about three weeks, because uh, most of the time the patients don't tolerate, they're with me. Um, maybe I don't have the magic hands that some of you guys have it, but to me, say three weeks is the maximum for me. And then uh, <clears throat> when they look at the endoscopic treatment, like intro, luminal OFT with leak less than two centimeters or with a sponge, right? Um, with a greater than two centimeters. What uh, Flaubert described or didn't really matter the size of the, of the leak that with either or one simple modification could use to every single one of them. Um, and that is a case to show the leak 10 days prior, as you can see that on the pictures is the evolution. And you can see that he's, Pretty much a, a, what he did was he took a four by four and wrap around on a pediatric NG2, right? And then took a tete drape, that's what we use here in, in America, because I know there's some um, other countries listening to the webinar. A tete drape is nothing more than a plastic, um, uh, piece of plastic that we, he wrapped around uh, the NG with a four by four and they sutured through it and made several holes on the plastics. So you actually, it's easier to go down and easier to go right into the orifice. So sometimes you don't even have to dilate the orifice, unless if the orifice has an abscess to it that you have to dilate it to clean up. But with that said, the results has been phenomenal with him. An acute leak, um, as you can see on, on this video here, the leak is small, kind of sort of acute, um, but there's different ways of kind of treat it here in this, Case. It was also treated with the same technique that uh, Flaubert des described, uh, with a, use the same VEC machine, intermittent flow. Sometimes they do, uh, they put a, um, a needle through it to kind of create the interception, the alternation of high and low 
In fact, if they don't have the machine, not every service in Brazil has this machine. So they have to hook up to the wall. So the way to do it, to create a high low weight, to put a, a needle through it. Um, and you can see it's completely closed on this patient. And the patient actually did extremely well uh, with that. Um, so overall, when you look at the picture on the left side, you can see, you can understand a little bit more in terms of what it looks like. This is a very low, low, low cost um, device, uh, especially if you come from a third country that we don't have all of the luxuries. I do have it because I'm here, but when we go down there, we don't have all the luxuries. I tend to take some of the staff with me so we can help some people down there. They're good for acute or chronic leaks. Uh, but I agree, sometimes uh, you have to be careful when you use them, especially if you use the sponge. Uh, if they have a lot of bleeding, I think the sponge can create more bleeding. Uh, almost no complication. They have a good efficacy. Uh, the problem here is you have to keep these patients with NG tubes for 14 days or 60 days, exchange them every couple of days. And that is not a comfortable, a lot of the patients don't tolerate that, okay? I can tell you that the patients that I have tried this on our service or from different services or even from thoracic service, a lot of them after three weeks, they just are begging not to use this, they're begging for a complete operation. So it's not as simple as people think about it. Um, you have to do a routine injury on these patients every 30 to 40 day to exchange uh, this. It's, in my mind, this is a low cost procedure, a salvage procedure for when you have tried everything and everything has failed, then you, tr you do that. Well, on Dr. Bar Abu Dhabi's case, there are two things that part of my mind was the, the vacuum or a septotomy um, and the uh, <coughs> extent of the space or, or whatever it was. So for that reason, I don't think a, 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 a vacuum would never be my first attempt to treat the endoscopic uh, leak. You build my hermamentarium, but it'd be more of a salvage uh, procedure. Thank you very much. I know it was short, I tried to keep it very concise. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andre. That was uh, fantastic. And the, definitely the EVACs uh, have a place. And I think your points about it being a, on the low budget side is um, wonderful. And it really works in those really, really tough situations. Chris, you wanna bring up your uh, slides? Um, and, um, you know, and I, I I'm uh, would just really appreciate that talk. I haven't actually used it. I go to too many hospitals for me to use it actually, for me to be able to take somebody back to the OR every couple of days just wouldn't work in my practice. But that's definitely a challenge of that technology. All right, so I'd like to introduce our next speaker, um, who is somebody who really is, is difficult to introduce because he has so many accolades and truly a pioneer in, uh, in bariatric endoscopy. Uh, Dr. Thompson is uh, the director of endoscopy at Brigham and Women's. Um, he's a professor of, uh, at Harvard Medical School. He directs the Advanced Endoscopy Fellowship Program. In fact, one of our uh, GI fellows went and spent some time with him and had a phenomenal time. He really appreciated his time there with Chris and he's gonna talk to us today about occlusive devices and sealants. So take it away, Chris. Thanks very much, Lena. Can you uh, see my slides? Yes. So I uh, just kind of take a step back here and, and look at what we're talking about. These are the various endoscopic management strategies. We have exclusion techniques like covered sense, the closure techniques. So we've covered nicely with some suturing, uh, hemostatic clips, cath monitor clips, internal drainage procedures with pigtail stents and back, uh, back therapy there. And then what I'm focusing on is occlusive devices and sealants. And uh, most of my talk will be spent on septal occluders, and uh, we'll touch a little bit on bioprosthetic uh, fistula plugs, fibromyalgia, and sound accolades. So, initial management steps are all pretty similar here. Uh, I do the procedure under GA with fluoroscopy and CO2. If I'm trying to find where a fistula is going, I'll inject contrast and methylene blue. I'll do bubble tests. I'll really track it down, like Barb did in his first case. You really have to get aggressive. 
at finding out where it is. Then you want to remove any foreign material. I'm pulling staples out there and removing suture material, any migrated drains you'll want to back out. Um, and make sure you do confirm adequate drainage. That's going to be important. And of course, as everyone's been talking about, uh, we have to treat distal obstruction, even when it might be subtle, as Eric had pointed out. So that's what you see is happening in the video. And uh, uh, you know, moving on to the septal occluder, uh, the bulk of my talk here. So this really started in, in the late 1980s, 1989, when the barred clamshell is made of stainless steel and had a polyester coating. But the newer versions are made of uh, flexible nitinol wire, uh, wire mesh, and uh, they're coated with Dacron uh, fabric or, or other materials as well. And you can see various ones listed here, the Amplats or septal occluders, the one I prefer because it has the largest variety of sizes and the reps will come bring a case of every size. So, you know, you can kind of get the best estimate of what size it'll be. And then you just pick from their, you know, from their bag. I'm not sure if others do that, but that's the easiest for us. You can see others, Cardio Seal and the, the, the Gore Medical one as well down there, but I tend to use them platzer. Um, and you see there's a variety of different kind of shapes and, and, and things. This is from a, a paper that we had published a couple years ago. Uh, and you can see on the left is the ASD device and the ventricular septal occluder device is on the right. And the sizes are here. And you can see kind of the anatomy of the stent. You have uh, two flanges. I like to think of it as on the proximal flange. You have the length of the waist B and then the diameter of the waist. And these are important dimensions to think about when you're trying to size your device to the, to, to the fistula that you're trying to close. And uh, you can see in, this, in, in the figure down here on the right, uh, you know, for the ASDs, uh, you have disc sizes that are quite large, up to 54 millimeters. So you can close rather large fistulas with this. You can see the waist length is not terribly large for the ASDs, only up to four millimeters. Something to keep in mind, the VSDs get a little longer, up to seven millimeters in length. And then the device waist, that's the kind of the middle segment here, can be quite wide, uh, you know, up to 38 millimeters or 18 for the VSD. So these are things to think about. Additionally, that delivery system is very short. So it is not going down an endoscope. Um, you can use it percutaneously. I'm gonna show a couple of different cases where I use it percutaneously, but I also use it endoscopically. And, and uh, how we use it endoscopically is shown here. I use a standard Oasis uh, stent delivery system and I'll cut the end off because uh, pediatric biopsy forceps will not fit through that lure lock. And then you run the, the forceps down. It's long enough to get all the way down there. But what you're gonna do then is pass that catheter through the endoscope channel and cut it to size because you want this as short as possible. It can be very hard to push the larger stents out of this catheter. Um, so here I'm grabbing, we, we use the pediatric biopsy forceps with the teeth, that's important as well. You grab the stent and then you pull it into that Oasis delivery system. And sometimes we'll pan it just to kind of, of course, uh, help with that process there. So that's, uh, that's uh, how we prepare it for delivery. We're gonna start with a video case here quickly. Um, and this is not using that system, but the off the shelf delivery system. And this has this patient has a esophageal pleural uh, cutaneous fistula. And uh, they've tried pretty much everything. And you can see the off the shelf system, which is, um, it's very short. So you're not gonna get that down, down an endoscope. And we put a wire basically using contrast in a balloon all the way from the mouth out the cutaneous tract. Then we'll, then we'll grab off uh, the wire with the forcep, pull the forcep out from the mouth out of the tract, and then grab the delivery system and pull it in. So it's kind of a lot of back and forth, but now the delivery system is going from outside the body through the skin into the esophagus. We deploy that distal flange, pull back pretty snug. You can see on the fluoroscopy there how it really is holding in place well as we pull back from the skin, we put, we're pulling back and you can see the, uh, the deployment where you have that, you know, that esophageal side flange kind of really holding it in place. Then we inject contrast from the luminal side and see it does not fill that tract at all anymore. And we know that it's done its job. So this is a, a nice way to use it if you have a, a, a percutaneous approach. Here's an endoscopic approach. There we're spraying it with Pam. He of course hits our lens, have to clean that. Uh, and then we're pulling it, the two flanges go into the catheter. As I've shown, now we're gonna drive down. And uh, uh, this is a proximal uh, fistula site here. We've already uh, applied some APC to it, easier to find. There it is, and we're advancing the catheter into the tract. 
And if you if you have fluoroscopic uh, visualization, this is helpful. We didn't do this one under fluoroscopy. We do a lot of these, and we're comfortable without using fluoro for certain fistula. You can see we we're, what we're doing now is we're pushing out the distal flange, and then we'll back up. And you can kind of see it a little bit in there that it's already opened up. You can kind of see it. And right there, you can see it. And then we're deploying the second flange. You can recapture if you need to. And then, um, then we'll test it by moving it back and forth. You want to see the whole kind of luminal wall, in this case, the gastric wall kind of move with it. Um, and that, that, you know, you know, that's in really good position. And then, uh, then we'll release it. And if you're doing it on a fluoroscopy, it's good to then you do a little contrast study, but you don't need to do that. Uh, so we did a systematic review on this back in, I think this was published originally in, in 2019 in this uh, online. And you can see there was a lot of potential relevant studies, over 25,000. Of course, it got down to only 19 and they were all case reports. So not a lot of great literature here. Uh, the vast majority, 13 of these were esophageal respiratory. So that's where they tend to be most utilized. There's just not a lot of other good options. Um, and then you can see there is a handful of other things, a few bariatric ones, um, some complex fistula as well. Mean size, 11 millimeters. A mean duration, they were mostly chronic at 64 weeks. And 72% of these had failed prior attempts at closure. Uh, and uh, the technical success, of course, a bunch of case reports and case series is 100%. Um, 17 out of 22 had successful closure long term. So clinically, 77%. Um, and that was at 33 weeks of follow-up. Adverse events were reported in uh, just over 22% of subjects, and this is mostly stent migrations. So uh, sometimes you get in growth and they really, they really stick in there, but uh, there were three stent migrations, so 13%. Uh, one fistula enlargement, uh, representing almost 5%, and then another one had both fistula enlargement and migration. So it can cause the fistula to enlarge, but it's kind of rare. Uh, you couldn't tell anything from the regression, nothing predictive. So because that was really such a small kind of systematic review. Uh, we decided to pool our experience together and we did a, a, a series with uh, the uh, Diogo and Eduardo de Mora and, and uh, uh, Alberto Baptista and some others. And you can see we, uh, we had a total of 43 uh, patients. Uh, these are all bariatric surgery uh, patients, 31 sleep gastrectomy, 12 gastric bypass, uh, three early, five, uh, th uh, three acute, five early, uh, 23 late and 12 chronic. So uh, 40 had failed previous attempts, 34 week follow-up. Our, our success, uh, again, 100% technical success, clinical success, 90%. So 39 were successful. Uh, it, it was unsuccessful in the one undrained chronic leak. So it's important to make sure you still have drainage if you have a bit of a cavity out there. It's just, it's not gonna do any good to do that. And then um, three acute leaks were not successful. We did a regression analysis, trying to find you know, what could be related to success and chronicity and pr prior treatments, which are probably collinear, were uh, related to successful treatments. So you want chronic fistula here. You don't want to pop these in acutely. Uh, you want these to be late or chronic fistula. And that's where we have a 97% success rate. And those acute ones, it was only about a 62% success rate and they all required more than one place. Moving on quickly to uh, Acellular bowel material. This is a porcine collagen plug. There's only case reports in small series here. I only use these when I have a cutaneous track, and quite frankly, I'm using occluders more consistently now than these. You can see how complicated it is to place them. First, you put a wire all the way through the track, and then what you do is you grab a snare and and you hold onto that snare from the skin side and pull it up through the mouth. Okay, and now you have the snare going from the skin out the mouth and you put a moist plug in that snare, okay? And you're gonna kind of chase it down at the same time you're pulling out with pressure. You wanna get enough plug there. We're really kind of pull, filling, pulling in with pressure and then we glue either side. So uh, multiple sessions typically required, uh, uh, you know, 30% of the time you might like out with one session, but I've only had modest success with these and prefer not to use them if possible. And finally, the last thing I was asked to mention was cyanoacrylates, maybe some fiber and sealants. There's a technical review from the ASGE on this. Uh, not a lot of experience in this, uh, uh, really limited again to case reports. Generally 0.5 to uh, three cc's are injected as a slow injection followed by usually some sterile saline and the success rates in the literature are 67 to 100%. Uh, sound accurately seems to be more effective than fiber and glue. Um, and the major risk here is that the glue will come back into kind of uh, one of the ductal structures or something and cause an obstruction. So mostly studied in biliary and pancreatic leaks. Um, 
And you can see here, uh, this is a, 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 the pooling the experience. There were 15 patients and it was successful in 11 of the 15 and it required up to four treatments. Um, as far as pancreatic fistula goes, uh, there's a, a nice series here by Stefan Seawald and his group uh, where they, they studied 12 patients injecting it. They went out as far as they could. They used some lipoidal with the injection as well. And they had a 67% success rate in these patients that were just not operative candidates. I eight out of 12 patients success, but very limited data on this. Something is a last resort if, if, if needed. So in conclusion, septal occluders are effective in the treatment of chronic fistula. And due to the high cost and, and some, some indication they do better in chronic fistula, they're really reserved even for critically ill patients with some sort of uh, you know, uh, esophageal uh, pulmonary issue or when other methods have failed. Collagen plugs can be effective in endocutaneous fistula, data is limited. Tissue sealants are most useful as adjunctive therapies or in pancreatic biliary fistula. And of course, anatomic features of fistula, of the fistula site must be considered in selecting the best therapy. Uh, thank you for your attention. Excellent talk, Dr. Thompson. I appreciate it. Uh, it uh, seems a promising uh, new modalities to help with these difficult situations. So thank you for uh, not only the uh, lecture, but the nice videos and the uh, uh, how to, to do it uh, videos. Appreciate it. Thanks. So last uh, but not least is my uh, partner and co-chair of the uh, bariatric committee, uh, Professor uh, Lena Keton. Uh, she is the director of bariatric and metabolic uh, surgery and the director of the Safjil and Swallowing Center. Uh, professor of Surgery at University Hospital in Cleveland. Uh, Lena is going to talk to us about surgical management of leaks after sleep gastrectomy. Uh, after sleep gastrectomy. Uh, Lena, the floor is yours. Lena, you're muted. there. Okay. Am I unmuted now? Indeed. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. I thought I was like an expert at Zooms and clearly not. Uh, wait, let me figure this out again. Thought I had it down. Okay. There we go. Okay, why is it not? Uh, oh, there we go. Okay, so uh, Barham, thank you so much. Um, uh, just thank you so much for putting together an amazing program and this great panel of, of people tonight. And um, well, it's night here in, in uh, Northeastern Ohio, but, um, but I, I have no disclosures and we'll talk a little bit about surgery. I mean, we've touched on surgery quite a bit through, through the, uh, um, evening here. And I think, you know, the big things that we've all talked about are acute leaks, chronic leaks, whether the holes are big, whether the holes are small. And these are all part of the decision-making process as to whether we want to use um, surgery or not. And then of course, how sick the patient is. And, uh, you know, if the patient's stable, can withstand endoscopy, sedation, sometimes even general anesthesia, you know, then we can approach this endoscopically. It's those patients who are unstable, who, uh, who really need that surgical intervention. But we know that if they're coming in with a sleeve leak, and particularly if it's an early sleeve leak, generally it's a non-contained leak. So our goal with surgery is to take that non-contained leak and control it um, to eventually hopefully control, make a controlled fistula, control the contamination, and get the patient out of that septic picture. And then, then we transition to the concept of the late leaks. And that's where we think about more definitive therapies with resections and reconstructions. Um, but with the great cases that have been presented and all the wonderful technologies we've heard about, we've really learned that, that surgery in these patients, um, years ago, surgery used to be the only thing we had. But uh, over the last decade, there's been a transition and it's been great to see this transition during my, um, during my career because we've taken what can be a really, really morbid situation 
and gotten these patients through these leaks. Uh, it used to be that a, a leak was almost 100% uh, associated with mortality, but now that we can use all these endoscopic uh, techniques, um, that mortality risk has gone way down. Um, so we really try to keep surgery as a last resort. And so early leaks, our goals of surgery are really controlling that contamination and ultimately make a controlled fistula. And late leaks are the ones where we're gonna look at that definitive therapy and resection. Um, Steve Leeds, as Eric had pointed out, has one of the largest uh, experiences looking uh, using the endovac and has put together some really nice series and has really tried to categorize these leaks based upon these concepts. I kind of simplified it with big holes, small holes, controlled, non-controlled leaks early and late, and he made it a little bit more scientific. Um, uh, and um, really the type three leaks, the ones with the complex uh, fistulas, either to the diaphragm or to the skin, these are the ones where we're really worried more uh, about um, surgery. So when we get to those late leaks and they don't tolerate the endoscopic procedures, well, what are we left with? Well, you know, Manuel said he was a plumber and as a surgeon, that's kind of what, what we're doing too. We're just trying to redo the plumbing so we can bypass the leak, remove the leak or um, uh, depressurize the leak. And so this is where our reconstructive uh, strategies come in. So um, if you have a patient with some sort of a, a stricture in their sleeve, uh, like this first picture here, okay, these leaks tend to be proximal because they get that high pressure um, here, um, I haven't been so brave to use something like a pneumatic dilator uh, balloon there, but uh, I've definitely learned a lot from the discussion this evening, and I might try that in the future. But um, these are the patients where you might need to do an esophago jejunostomy. So we're going to divide the esophagus here and then do a Ruin Y reconstruction uh, to essentially remove the leak and depressurize the system. If you have a patient with a more normal mortho morphology leak, this was a patient of mine who had a VAD and we, uh, an LVAD in place and unfortunately developed an early leak after his sleeve. We were able to manage it um, with endoscopic uh, um, stenting and external drainage. Um, but if that leak did not go away and they have normal sleeve um, path, uh, anatomy and morphology, this is where the fistula jejunostomy would come into play. So this is where you're gonna take a piece of small bowel and just patch it almost like a gram patch, but with a piece of intestine uh, right over that hole. And again, that relieves the pressure and it's depressurizing the system to Natan's point and Manuel's point. So if you can do that in other ways at the incisura, you might wanna try that first before you get to this fistula jejunostomy. And then finally, if you have somebody with a, a distal leak, um, in the sleeve, this is where a Ruin Y reconstruction um, might be more helpful. And you just take that leak out of the continuity of the procedure. You wanna optimize your patients prior to surgery. Nutrition has been discussed a lot and that's really key. Whether you place a, a J tube, you place a Dobhoff tube past the leak, although patients don't really like that tube in their nose. Um, you can use TPN, but that has its own whole set of complications in these patients who are already sick. Um, I think the consensus on the, the call this evening has been that the J-tube seems to be the, the best uh, source of nutrition, but you want to optimize that nutrition. If the patient does have any distal obstruction, think about that and choosing how you're going to do that reconstruction. If the hole's small, then you want to go to some of those occluders that Chris talked about because maybe you can avoid that surgery. The chronicity of the leak, meaning if the leak doesn't go away, then yeah, surgery is where we end up. And then if there's a remaining abscess cavity, Eric pointed out, you wanna obliterate that cavity. And if you, you can obliterate it, then again, that's where surgery comes in because maybe you need some better drainage uh, um, for that patient. Uh, I don't wanna take uh, the wind out of Manuel's sails, but there's several algorithms that have been proposed as to where surgery um, falls into the algorithm of management of a sleeve leak. And um, fortunately, these things don't happen often, so it's really hard to come up with an 
algorithm for a uh, relatively uh, uncommon event, um, but, uh, but they've been proposed in several different areas with the arrows pointing out where surgery uh, might be helpful in these two particular algorithms that have been proposed in the literature. I think the take home messages are that sleeve leaks are complex. Uh, there really isn't a real playbook. So I'm really excited to hear what Manuel has to say. Uh, so he can give us uh, somewhat of a playbook for these really, really tough and challenging patients. But if we stick to our principles of controlling the contamination, depressurizing uh, the system, um, then surgery really can be uh, kind of reserved more for the early uh, stages of it to control and drain the sepsis. Um, and really rarely do we get to the late part of the management where surgery might be required. So thank you very much and I uh, appreciate your attention. Thank you so much, Lena, for your excellent lecture. Now we go to the final block of our webinar, which is the part where uh, Professor Manuel Galbao is gonna help us put it all together uh, in a state-of-the-art summary and hopefully keep give us a clinically relevant approach uh, to the management of sleeve leaks. Dr. Galbao needs no introduction. Uh, he is a pioneer uh, who proctored many in the field of bariatric endoscopy and complication management. He truly is an expert in the field who uh, does many procedures and, uh, and, and uh, we look forward to his lecture uh, about uh, sleeve leaks management. Without further ado, Manuel, do you wanna pull your slides, please? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Braham. Uh, thank uh, American for Good Society for the opportunity of talking that. Thank you, Lena. You both for leading the way and what, what we should. So my slides should be prompted right now. And uh, that's the, the purpose what we are here and to talk about this very specific topic that is a sleeve leak. So this is my uh, potential uh, conflicts of interest. I offer you to judge if it's gonna be commercial or not, but specifically with that talk, I don't think I have any conflict potential on that. So sleeve gastrectomy leak, what is this topic? What is it all about? So we, we must understand it better. So, and state of the art means that uh, we really have defined yet what is, should be put it on like an algorithm on a order way to do that. And that's the situation of the sleeve leak. So looks, the sleeve looks like this beautiful, beautiful cloud because the sleeve is the most performance bariatric surgery worldwide. But let me tell you this, this beautiful cloud is a cumulus nimbus. So any commercial airplane that goes inside, that cloud will go down. So beauty can do damage. How it is? So we have to understand why this such a simple concept of taking down the vessels and nerves that the greater curvature with the energy device that you guys have now is very easy. And then you put a roller that is a, a bougie. And then you staple from uh, the bottom to the top in a straight line. So what can go wrong? So let's see uh, like this. So by the way, uh, bariatric surgery is as safe as a lab coating. The incidence of sleeve leaks are decreasing and nothing that you're gonna see from now on will contradict that, okay? But they happen. And as bariatric surgery is done in numbers like 200,000 per year in US, 100,000 year, 100,000 cases in Brazil, they will happen. So let's take a look of this beautiful work of uh, Marquezini from Brazil's son and father. So they they show us the vascularization uh, of the of the stomach itself. So we have five uh, main branches, and you can see here that is like uh, an empty space on the his angle. Also, uh, most of the leaks are proximal, and as I stated before, for the the presenters previous me, uh, there is under a negative pressure from the thorax, this kind of leak. So no matter what, you take part of the stomach, there's nothing to block that. So the trajectory of the leak gonna be long, tortuous and complex, and it will be labiated uh, by obligation. There's a, lab, a very long staple line with crossings that can uh, put, cause uh, additional ischemia and uh, weak parts on that. And also the stomach, it's serial thick downwards. So the contractions are very strong on, uh, on the entry. Stenosis 
we have to talk it because most of the leaks comes with stenosis and stenosis in the sleep is very tricky because sometimes it's hard to recognize the endoscopies were not trained to that. And it goes against one of the main dogmas of endoscopy. That is, if my scope passes through, that's no such stenosis. And on the sleeve gastrectomy, all of them are gonna be trespassed with the scope because this is a functional stenosis. So let's talk about the, the endoscopy we should have. So it's a tube after a tube. So your scope have to go down smoothly by the smaller curvature and then have to face the incisura. And one thing, if you don't see across the incisura, don't see ahead of the incisura, something is wrong. Also, if you need to do 15 degrees with your thumb in the upper wheel, in the big wheel, and you have to turn your right hand more than 15 degrees, possibly you have an active deviation. Who has taught us doing our endoscopy learning? Nobody. So, and that's, that's hard to. So it all comes to pressure. It's pressure, 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 as you have, heard that name so many times before we get in this presentation. And you know what? It takes a while to understand why this beautiful small dragon can become like this and make such a fire on that. And I'll tell you that with example. So that's us. We just awakened the dragon with the sleeve. The gastrobronchial fistula before the sleeve gastrectomy was dormant. It was uh, the dominium of uh, esophageal surgery on that. And then it comes and you have, have heard on this previous presentation that it exists. And you can see here what we are talking about, very severe cases. And you, I'll get back here, this 2011 that we published that. And this is easy to forget. And even worse, at that time, we are losing the war because we are using the, the same traditional endoscopic approach to treat the sleeve leaks and we fail hard at a level that we get the publication like that with 12 cases of total gastrectomy. And this is the year 2014, but they come from this previous series that I talked to you about. We were losing the battle until we understand that it's about pressure. And look at this beautiful paper coming from Italy, from bioengineering. So they have this bench model. So look it up, more green, less pressure, more yellow and more red, more pressure. So they are empty models. And then when they pressurize with liquids, those models, look at L1 and L2. L1 is a, a narrow sleep gastrectomy and L2 is a more bold sleep gastrectomy. And when you compare with E1, E2, that sleep gast gastroplasty is, is quite a difference on that. So that's a lot of ways to see that. And look at the, these ones in um, high resolution manometry. So upper color bar is upper esophageal sphincter, inferior color bar uh, is the lower esophageal sphincter. So look at the right, you see how pressurized is, uh, how pressurized is, uh, the, is the stomach uh, after the sleeve gastrectomy. And here is for our own work. And you can also see, look at the inferior color bar and you're gonna see the pressurization of uh, the stomach after the sleeve gastrectomy. And we go to high resolution, or oh, sorry, to uh, a impedance pH metry. You can see here that reflux are uh, something that is common uh, for that. And if you, it's not just the case that we witness, but you can see here on publications that uh, the sleeve gastrectomy, it uh, put the pressure higher and the compliance is lower on that. And the stomach, original stomach is a uh, low pressure, high compliance system on that. And also you can see here the, the reflux by your own eyes. So what are the surgical options that Lina brought to us? So acute, you go to damage control, drain percutaneous, laparoscopic, suturing. We, we saw that uh, most of the surgeons don't, don't like to do that. Uh, they like to wash it and uh, put the drain. Chronic, when uh, we exhausted all the options, as Lina stated very well, convert to renal white gastric bypass, esophagostomy in a loop or renal white gastric bypass, but taking out the remnant or not uh, as a total gastrectomy to do that. And this is very well illustrated in this paper coming from France, so our friend Mario, Marius Nadelko and uh, Patrick Noel. So they study more than uh, uh, 400, sorry, 473 uh, studies and they get out uh, with those retrospective small series on that. Important. Those are the options that they find in the literature. And you see here, the cases are difficult. 
look at the conversion rates, look at the leak rates. So it's a revision of surgery that carries here, there its own risk. So uh, you saw also in this uh, webinar that the surgeons try to avoid going to surgery if they can on that. So what are the endoscopic options? We're gonna just summarize what we saw with some perspective. I have a very good news to you all. We have a lot of endoscopic tools, as you can see on the screen, to close the, the leak and they are very effective. And I have a bad news. They are so effective that each one who does a method uh, publish and defend that it's no other method exists. So that's very few common sense on that. And we I try, try to bring some common sense to whatever. So, and uh, look, starting with common sense, the classification that we all use comes from this paper, that's con this consensus that is from 2011. And this classification comes with no science. It was a consensus and luckily, it has some clinical impact. So I have acute, early, late, and chronic. So if you say, Manuel, that's not enough evidence. Well, this article is cited on literature since 2011, 765 times. So it must import at least on dictate the best clinical practice. So let's start with the stents. So stents is, is very like attractive because it occludes the holes the hole and it opens up the sleeve, it takes down the pressure. So let's see what the literature. So this is a very good meta-analysis from Sao Paulo University specifically about uh, uh, bariatric leaks and specifically about sleeve leaks, 24 studies, 187 patients, a bariatric age, a bariatric BMI, and doesn't matter the type of stent you use it, most of them are esophageal, you have a high success rate of 72.8%. That's very interesting. As uh, anticipated, 94% uh, of the leaks are proximal because of the pathophysiology that we just described. And you can see here, uh, the stents are using for acute and early. If you put that together, you're gonna have almost 80% uh, of uh, the literature on that. And bad news, 1.4 stents per patient and migration rate of 28.2. So the Achilles tendon of these techniques on that. And uh, meta-analysis, and as we're gonna do a meta-analysis, I, I, it's a word of warning of uh, our colleagues that are gonna do that. Meta-analysis have serious, serious problems on finding fine and small things. So no perforations reported, two bleedings that require additional procedure and no deaths reported. And why they escape the meta-analysis? Because they're case reports. So we have to go on that. And how about we use the bariatric stents? At that time, we designed our own bariatric stents uh, for with a company uh, in Argentina. And uh, we published that. We get 100% success. But please read the small letters. All patients face hell for five days. After that, they settle. You have to watch your stent each week because they migrate, even their, their bariatric stent. And as, uh, as Eric uh, also said, you have to take care of them and don't let them for many times. More than four weeks, you're looking for trouble. So we could uh, manage the migration rates with intensive uh, follow-up on that. But what happened with the same stents go to more people? So uh, reference centers, small centers, big series, small series. So that's in Brazil. And that's very more sophisticated stents, the Korean stents on that. You see, that's how sophisticated are the design. And you see here on that slide that they can solve that. So A is the leak, uh, B is the radiology saying the leak outside and C and D how it apply and then uh, how it's staying in place. But the same paper can show you that. Letter A, you're seeing the pleura after the stent. Letter B, you're seeing the stent on the bowel. Letter C, you're seeing the stent operated. Letter D, what you're seeing is that part that is yellow, yes, is the omentum there, this blocked perforation. Letter E is a distal ulcer. Letter E is a submucosal abscess. So you see, and we have more than 80% of resolution, but at some cost. And even worse, you saw that uh, we just saw this before, an aortic uh, lesion with the stent in the sleeve leak, but even worse, we have this paper coming from France with five 
aortic injuries with those bariatric stents. So it means it has good and has bad. You have to evaluate it very carefully on that. So if you're gonna use it, understand and follow the patients. Pigtails is uh, easy going. As you can see here, uh, this is the, the sleeve with the uh, distal obstruction and the, the leak. You put one side of the stent outside in the cavity and the other side here. So it's a beautiful internal drainage and please take your sterile drainage out. Otherwise the pressure not gonna equalize. So that said, we have quite some uh, now some publications and look at this systematic review, 681 uh, patients. We call this French techniques. Just look at the country, you see French, 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 and now it's spreading all over the world, but with very few complications that Ellison states very well, 13.73% and 84.42%. The main complications were on the fresh leaks and that uh, it was, uh, we're dealing with uh, some fresh perforations and inflammation outside on that. So the EVAC, new piece on the block, very well presented by Andre. And you see here is a very effective and to make justice, it was invented and designed in, I think in Germany or in Europe, and it was designed for disasters, for day senses. And they work extremely well on that. And as presented, patients with a nasal gastric tube, something getting out of their nose, maybe not good. Look at this very, uh, very preliminary paper. 10.3 procedures per case, 50 days of treatment, nine patients, and they have all success on, on the healing. And this more, uh, that's a more uh, like a newer one using a, a technique very close with our colleague Flaubert have disclosed it. So they have this four by four gauzes and even more sophisticated because they have an other tube that they can feed the patient like a three way. So it's very, very nice. And uh, perfecting that without the sponge, they have just 10 days of EVG. We don't know how many days they have in the hospital, but that is specific for treatment and just 3.3 uh, sessions, but this quite some. And all we have here, uh, 19 days of hospitalization. So this uh, already we presented, Dr. Fowler present that, develop his own technique, is what is massively used in Brazil for that. And then we call the septotomy that was developed by Dr. Josenberg and ourselves. And the idea is that if you ever see a sleeve leak is like this, you're always gonna see a septum and they'll develop for chronic uh, leaks. So the septum is the staple line, there's no major vessels anymore. So just go there and cut it. And yes, you make it bigger, to make it small, but you have to associate aggressive pneumatic dilation to take down the pressure. So that is the, the basis and the concepts of this technique that have been published in the small series. And now we have this, uh, this publication here uh, that comes uh, for Dana Portier and we're on. So you can see here, they study all of the publications and, and they're again, as Lena stated, there's so many algorithms down there that we, we have to find one that makes sense really. And you see here, they are perfecting the technique uh, and septotomy has a downside that you have to do one more than one session, but they perfect that they are more aggressive. And uh, so four of, out of five cases they can solve with just one session on that. And those are the publications. And you can see here uh, uh, the kind of dilation, numbers of dilation, numbers of sections uh, to do that and the time to, to close the leak takes a little bit more time but seems to work. Suturing, we already talked about it. Suturing directly might not work, but suturing the stent in place can be a good collateral to keep it in place. There is a series of presentations on that. Ovesco, over the scope clip, quite some publications, very interesting because they were very successful in the beginning. And it's very appealing because it's just you go there, you put everything inside, you fire the gigantic bear claw trap like clip and it's supposed to close it, but it's not like digs, like suturing. So let's take a look at this very recent paper that question the efficacy. And we burn, and more, most important, uh, that it burn bridges because by using the uh, over the scope clip on 26 patients, end up on 11 patients with total gastrectomy with zocomedicinostomy in that series. So we have to take care of this. The occluder. Brilliant presentation as usual from Thompson and the already show, I don't have anything more to add. They were designed, as you can see here, for chronic 
uh, and more complex cases, as you can see here. And then we have it here, it comes from Braham. So what you can use to treat it. So you can cover the hole and pass the incisura and take down the pressure with the stents. You can use endovacuum therapy uh, internally or outside with a very creative way like Braham did with naso, naso BDRE like tubes or with the vacuum that is designed. You can do internal drainage, you can aggressively delay that or you can use occluded methods for that. So I have prepared these to you guys that are gonna build the algorithm. So don't be confused, don't be angry with me. I'm gonna break it down one by one. So in this first, you have the stents. The stents are good for acute, bad for chronic. Get us a fast healing time. The cost is kind of high depending on the type of stent that you use it. Uh, the patient comfort is no good at all. And as Mike just stated, if the patient is feeling very well about the stand, go look for the stand. Probably the stand is on the boil. In that case, it was not Mike because you sutured that. Uh, complications, you see, it can go for more complications and efficacy is good in a general way. How about the pigtails? Good for acute, good for chronic. Uh, faster healing time, not that much, but it doesn't matter because the patient doesn't feel that, not you. And why is such a long healing time? Because the patient forgets to come and you forget to call the patient most of the time. So patient comfort is good, complication is low, efficacy is good in that. How about the septotomy? It's not for acute, it's for chronic. Uh, faster healing time is not his, his module. So we're gonna do more than one session. Patient comfort is good because after septotomy, patient can go home. Complication seems, be, besides being very aggressive, it seems that people that does it, they, they have advanced skills. So the publications have no much complications and efficacy is good. Uh, over the scope clip, Ovesco, it, can, it was being used for acute, for chronic, uh, fasting healing time, if it works, the cost is high depending on where you are. Uh, patient comfort is good, complications, they are reported like they, uh, if they doesn't work, what you do with that? So we have to put that on the complication side of that. And efficacy seems to be good, but you see here that the newer publication questioned that. Direct suturing can be for acute, for chronic, fast healing time, if it works, the cost is high, patient comfort is good, complications is low, and the efficacy is as low as the complication rates. So how about the EVAC, acute and chronic, Fasting healing time, have you saw the presentations, patient in the hostel with a nasogastric tube. The cost is the lowest possibly if you don't add the cost of the patient inside the hostel for a longer period of time. Complications low, efficacy is good. So we have uh, the occluder, as you we stated before, prochronic, faster healing time because it block, if it blocks is is uh, healed. Uh, the cost is very expensive, that, as any kind of uh, cardiac intervention in the luminal or in the, in the vascular, sorry. Uh, patient comfort is good. Uh, complications, very small, as, as you saw in the quiz presentation. Efficacy is good, uh, is good as well. So balloons. Balloons, they don't treat directly, but they are used as collateral on that. They're not used for acute because it can perforate. For chronic and later leaks, yes. Uh, faster healing times, we don't know because it's collateral on that. The cost is good, it's old technique. Patient comfort is good. Once you do the dilation, you feel a little bit pain, it's good. Complication low, efficacy is not a study uh, on that. So again, another one that's not polluted. Uh, Non-wallet cavity, stents good. Wallet cavity, the stents are good also. Uh, patient with sepsis, it can be used. Stenosis ahead, it will open up. Uh, you need advanced skills to do a stent. So that's, you need advanced skill. No need to high tech. This is a considered high technique uh, for some. And uh, there is a drain needed, at least from the beginning on that. So the pigtails, non wallet cavity, is better not to, wall cavity is good to go, patient with sepsis is good to go, stenosis ahead, it doesn't treat, uh, that no advanced skills needed to do that, is just to put a guide wire, put that inside. 
uh, no need for high and low tech and drain needed, uh, no, because you have to remove the drain most of the time for that. Septotomy, uh, non-wallet cavity is a no-go, wallet cavity is a go, patient with sepsis is a go, stenosis ahead uh, is a go because we use uh, associated pneumatic dilation. Uh, you need advanced skills, it's a uh, high cost because of the need of a repeat procedure and the knife that you're gonna use, and uh, the drain you have to remove also on that. Over the scope, non-wallet cavity is a good to go. Wallet cavity, I don't think is a good one because you're gonna close and the cavity gonna be there without drain or whatever. Patient with sepsis, is, it's hard to do that in patient with sepsis. Uh, don't treat the stenosis ahead. Uh, you need advanced skills to do that because it's an advanced uh, procedure. Uh, and uh, high tech, no, it's just the endoscope to do that and the drain uh, must be needed on that. Direct suturing, uh, non-wallet cavity is the best thing to do. Wallet cavity is again, you're gonna close a wallet cavity. You need to drain it inside. Uh, patient with sepsis is a go. Uh, stenosis ahead doesn't treat. It needs advanced skills and it is a high tech on that. And the drain, uh, most of the times it is needed uh, also on that. So the EVAC, non-wallet cavity, wallet cavity, wherever you can use that. Sepsis is the best thing to do that. So stenosis ahead is not gonna train, not gonna treat, uh, doesn't need advanced skills, doesn't need high tech, uh, and the drain uh, also have to, be, uh, have to be removed on that. Uh, the occluder, non-wallet cavity is a no-go. Wallet cavity is what it's good for. Patient with sepsis uh, is not being used on that. Most of the patients don't have sepsis anymore. Doesn't treat the stenosis ahead. It's an advanced procedure, uh, needs high tech, uh, and, uh, and needs to drain uh, most of the time. And the balloon, uh, you can do whatever. No wallet, wallet, sepsis, it treats the nausea head, uh, don't need advanced skills, uh, no high tech, uh, and the drain, we don't have an idea because it's a collateral, is not the main uh, for that. So uh, with that, uh, with that, I rest. And again, thank you very much. And I hope from the bottom of my heart that I could fulfill the expectations uh, that was so high on this presentation. Thank you once more. Manuel, this is a phenomenal job and truly, truly appreciate it. You've uh, gave us a very good roadmap and synthesis of everything in a state-of-the-art fashion. So very much uh, appreciated. With that, we come to the end of the webinar on behalf of myself and uh, Dr. Katan. Uh, we thank the uh, moderators, uh, the panelists, the uh, lecturers for a phenomenal job. Everybody spent so much effort to put this program together. Definitely came uh, and reflects in the content. I think this is the most condensed and comprehensive approach to sleeve leaks that I've seen in, in the, uh, in the, uh, for the past few years. So the next step for us as the Bariatric Committee of AFS, we want to make this uh, clinically relevant. So uh, Dr. Chow and Dr. Vargas is going to take the content from this webinar, try to synthesize it in a clinically relevant algorithm try to put some science behind it through a systematic review and maybe meta-analysis to some of the topics. And we hope that we publish it, publish it on the AFS website and in, in, in the journal for the Society for Gut. And we'll continue that theme of webinars where we focus on one topic and we go in depth and have a mixture of, of case presentation, didactics, and clinically relevant uh, state of the art synthesis and algorithm. And with that, again, very grateful, uh, very well attended webinar. We appreciate everybody's effort and wish everybody a good night. Thanks, everyone. Arham, Arham first, yes. I want to thank you, Lina, and the coordinator for this team. Second, I suggest to whoever is going to do the algorithm, <clears throat> most of the algorithm I see, they don't include diagnosis or anatomical diagnosis. I think this time is a different disease. I think we should include the diagnosis and the anatomical structure because this is a different animal. So I think we need to include that, not only an algorithm for treatment, but an algorithm to define the treatment according to the findings. That would be my suggestion to Vargas and the group.
Excellent suggestion, Nathan. Any other points of discussion uh, from, from the panel uh, presented here? I agree with Nathan. I think we need to have, give a little bit more anatomical and diagnosis with that because it makes a huge difference. Fantastic. All right. Thank you, colleagues. Very much appreciated. Uh, and thank you for all the effort and wish everybody a good night. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much for those great contributions. Great talks Thanks, tonight. Lena. I learned a lot. Thanks, Barham. Thanks, Lena. Thanks, Eric. Mike, Reem, Tabeg, Chris. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good job. Great.